All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Uh, we're going to get started. I've seen a lot of people trickling in, um, so we might as well get the day, day going because we have a lot on our schedule. Um, so first of all, my name is Christy Naren. I am the Director of the Office of Sustainability here at the University of Manitoba, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here hosting our fifth annual Sustainability Day. Uh, before we start, I just want to point out that if you're having any technical difficulties, as we all know this comes up, uh, you can type your concerns either into the chat or the Q&A box below. Uh, there are IST staff members standing by to assist you with anything you'll need. Um, as well, if you require any of the materials presented today in an accessible format, just let us know and we can get those to you. Uh, lastly, if you would like to turn on closed captioning for today's presentations, you can click the CC button on your screen. Uh, we'll also be recording the event, so you're able, if you're unable to attend today, um, you can still view all the presentations on our website. I'd like to acknowledge that we gather here today on Treaty 1 territory, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. The water we have to drink today comes from Treaty 3 area, from the shores of the Shell Lake First Nation, number 39 and 40. The electricity powering our computers for this event come from generating stations on the rivers in Treaty areas number 1, 3, and 5. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in participation and partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. To start off this exciting day, I would like to welcome a very special guest named Elder Wanda Murdoch, leading Earth Woman, to open our day with a song from the land. Elder Wanda Murdoch, just give me one second. Uh, Wanda Joy Murdoch is the elder in residence at the Indigenous Student Center at the University of Manitoba. Wanda grew up in Fisher River Cree Nation and worked in the healthcare field for 21 years. Elder Wanda's spiritual journey began as a young child when she began receiving visits from the grandmothers and grandfathers who shared their knowledge with her. She has continued to learn through sweat lodge, fasting, sun dance, and regularly attending ceremony. In 2019, Elder Wanda's spiritual path guided her to the Indigenous Student Center here at the University of Manitoba, where she takes a mindful and holistic approach to support students, staff in their own spiritual journeys. Welcome, Elder Wanda. Uh, Tansy, my name is Nika Niskanaskisku. Uh, I'm Red Turtle Clan. And I'm very honored to uh, come and sit with you this morning. Uh, I received a tobacco tie from uh, Christy. And normally when you meet with elders uh, for uh, acknowledgement, uh, this is what we do. And when I come to take these offerings, I, this tobacco goes into the fire and I burn it after uh, once I meet uh, going to ceremony. Uh, this morning, I'd like to honor you with a, a song that that we sing when we go into a sweat lodge and that's calling in uh, the creator, calling in all of us, calling in the grandfathers and calling in the grandmothers. And this is a very uh, um, ceremonial song that, that we uh, go when we go, we're acknowledging uh, uh, the connection to the spirit world to come and help during this time. and. Uh, all my prayers go into the song and to acknowledge the creator, the creation, and all us as brothers and sisters. So with that, I wanted to say, you uh, go say. And this drum uh, is the connection to the spirit world. It carries the spirit of the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And uh, it's when we, when we hit it, we go to the four directions. And just to let the before grandmothers know and the grandfathers know that it's time for ceremony and they hear this, this sound of the drum and to awaken those spirits, that connection. This is why it's so important, uh, this tobacco tie. Uh, this, this speaks on your behalf. This speaks on behalf of the, your uh, teachers, your professors, uh, whoever you're working with uh, over the, uh, this, this new year again. So I want to thank Creator for each and every one of these that are here uh, this morning. And 
So with that being said, I wanted to say I was safe. So that being said, I honor you with this song. And when you come together as a group, all your uh, talks about today goes into this tobacco tie. And you're requesting um, the help from the creator and those grandmothers and grandfathers to help you along with your studies. And, you know, university is a very hard uh, academically institution, but it's just uh, about learning. So I wish you all good luck and uh, honor to Come and sit with you this morning. How are you, Sunny? They will say. Thank you, Christy. Thank you very much, Elder Wanda. Um, I encourage each and every one of you to attend events hosted by the Indigenous Student Center. The center hosts a number of regular events, which are open to students, staff, and faculty, such as sharing circles, talking circles, and fireside chats. Our esteemed guest, Elder Wanda, even hosts a women's sharing circle on Mondays. Um, for more information, just visit umanitoba.ca slash, slash Indigenous and click on the events tab. I would now like to invite Dr. Michael Benarash to provide us with some welcome remarks to the event. Um, Dr. Benarash is the University of Manitoba's 12th President and Vice Chancellor and has been in his role since July 2020. His career includes, but is not limited to, serving as the Provost and Vice President Academic at Ryerson University 2017 to 2020, acting as the institution, institution's chief academic and operating officer, as well as a professor in the Department of Economics. He co-chaired Ryerson's Truth and Reconciliation Implementation Committee and is an act, active advocate for the advancement of Indigenous engagement and reconciliation. Before his work at Ryerson, he led the Asper School of Business as Dean from 2011 to 2017. Welcome, Dr. Benarash. Thank you so much, uh, Christy, and uh, McGwitch Elder Murdoch, thank you for that. Um, as uh, I, I, just, just a few remarks uh, to welcome everybody, and as President and Vice Chancellor, it, it really is a pleasure to be here on Sustainability Day uh, uh, for this year. And, and I've, I'd like to first take a moment to thank Jeff Wharton, our Minister for the Environment, Climate and Parks, 
uh, Terry Duguid, who is a, who's an ad, a big advocate for our university um, and for sustainability, the member of parliament for Winnipeg South and deputy mayor Marcus Chambers for sharing messages uh, on sustainability day today. Um, at the University of Manitoba, where we are being guided by our sustainability strategy um, that, that we've set from 2019 to 2023. And um, we're committed to being a sustainable leader um, by operating a, a really efficient campus while um, recognizing the, the current need to, to act. Um, the event today not only celebrates innovative ideas and the work that's being done at U of M and its partners, but also offers valuable ways for our community to learn more uh, about how we can make, make a difference. Um, and the U of M developed its climate action plan uh, in order to reach a 50% reduction of emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050. It's my personal hope as president, um, and I, I'll try to push our institution to meet the goals before those timeframes. Um, recently, what we've been doing to, to get to there is we've established a, re a responsible investment uh, committee and we're reviewing all of our investments um, and looking at, um, at those investments from a perspective of their carbon footprint um, and recommending investment opportunities for the University of Manitoba, which reduces our, com uh, our carbon footprint, but also investment that um, creates opportunities for indigenous organizations. And so that committee is doing its work as we speak. Um, our sustainability strategy includes implementing our, an organic waste management program, creating student sustainability ambassador program, minimizing our greenhouse gas emissions and managing our campus lands. And there's been projects initiated by students and supported by staff and faculty on, on the campus. Uh, in addition, I'm, I'm excited to tell you, and we, we did make this announcement earlier, um, but the university received $14.4 million from investing in Canada um, for an infrastructure program to support upgrades to our central energy plant and the Max Bell Center. $35 million uh, program. So the university is investing $21 million. And what we're doing with this, uh, these funds is we are going to improve uh, and upgrade 41 major buildings at the University of Manitoba by improving their energy efficiency and reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're going to improve, we're going to make upgrades at the Max Bell Center, including the ventilation system. Uh, to improve air quality and the operation efficiencies uh, will we'll improve uh, uh, the efficiencies within that building by 30%. Overall, this project will decrease greenhouse gas emissions at the University of Manitoba by just over 40% and save us 12.2 tons. Um, I think this is, a, this is a big step towards our goal of 2030, and, and this is why I'm optimistic that we can, um, by implementing this and other projects, that we can not only meet the goals that we've set for our institution, but exceed those goals and uh, achieve the goals much earlier in time. Um, I think a big part of this is the work of our sustainability office and, and the partners here at the University of Manitoba. Um, what I always tell our students, staff, and faculty is that you should speak up, you should bring new ideas forward, and you should let the U of M know when we're not meeting the targets that we've set for ourselves so that um, it will increase the pressure on the institution to meet these targets because um, our climate can't wait, our planet can't wait, um, and this has to be a major priority. I'm really proud of the work that's being done at the University of Manitoba. I'm proud of the commitment and dedication of our, of our team. And I think that uh, together we will build a University of Manitoba that is sustainable um, uh, into the future. I'd like to now turn it over to Minister Wharton for a message on Sustainability Day. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Wharton, Minister of Environment, Climate and Parks, and I'm thrilled to hear about 
the 2022 University of Manitoba's Sustainability Day will focus on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I am honoured by the invitation to share my thoughts on these goals and share what our government is doing to advance this goal priority. These ambitious and important goals are in line with our government's priorities in supporting the collective fight against climate change and protection of our natural spaces and resources. We as Manitobans benefit from the cleanest form of emissions-free electricity. We want to make the best use of this, this energy to stimulate our economy, economic development, while investing in climate resilient infrastructure and waste systems. Last year, we increased the blending requirements for renewable fuels in gasoline to 10% and in diesel to 5%. These mark the highest biofuel blending requirements in Canada. But that's not all. Efficient, efficient trucking program with over $11 million in joint provincial federal support provides incentives to install fuel saving devices to retrofit heavy duty freight trucks for their emissions and protect our environment. Additionally, Manitoba created $20 million endowment fund to invest in long-term sustainability for our beautiful provincial parks. Efficiency Manitoba also offers over 35 programs and rebates to improve energy efficiency in residential, commercial, agriculture, industrial, and indigenous communities. We also secured support from the federal low carbon economy fund to double our investment to $32.2 million in energy efficient equipment and retrofits. Collaborating with our Prairie Provinces, Manitoba invested in Climate West to provide climate data and better adaptation services to the province. As well, the Manitoba Climate Resilience Training Project supports the implementation of adaptation measures by both Indigenous and Northern communities. With an investment of over $200 million, our government helps farmers, watershed districts, and communities protect our ecosystems and watersheds through the Conservation and Grow Trusts. I am proud that the University of Manitoba is a member institution of the United Nations Academic Impact, working towards the goals of clean water and sanitation. Your significant contributions in biosystems engineering, clean energy, climate science, and Arctic ecosystems will have a long-lasting impact on Manitoba and right across Canada. Our government is proud of the work you do, and we look forward to working alongside you as we move towards a greener future together. Thank you. Merci. Megwitch. I appreciate the kind words from Minister Wharton. And lastly, I'd like to welcome a video message from Councillor Marcus Chambers, who's the City Councillor of St. Norbert and the St. River. Thank you for inviting me to bring greetings for the University of Manitoba's 2022 Virtual Sustainability Day. I wish to start by acknowledging Winnipeg is located within Treaty 1 territory. The ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Inuit, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, and is the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis Nation homeland. I'm both honored and humbled to provide greetings at this event. In 2022, Sustainability Day will consist of a full day of virtual programs open to University of Manitoba students, staff, faculty, and external partners, and will inspire participants to take action for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Proper planning of objectives and mapping a pathway allows researchers and policy developers to do their work and due diligence towards sustainable solutions that benefit us all. As we reflect on the year of 2021, we must recognize that it was one of the most challenging in recent history. In fact, this century. But through it all, we have adjusted and have adapted and are more resilient and capable of facing what is before us. Over the course of Virtual Sustainability Day, take time to participate in as many of the presentations that are taking place and hear how the University of Manitoba is taking action to create a blueprint that will help us all achieve a healthier and sustainable future. I'm so inspired by young leaders of tomorrow that have been molded into climate activists and creating climate action goals that benefit us all. I'm confident that as you lead, you will potentially play a crucial role in solving some of our greatest social challenges 
including climate change and addressing longevity and sustainability of our planet. Our planet's future will depend on how we are able to adapt and adjust and the challenges of present and future. I'm profoundly optimistic on just how far reaching your abilities are if you work collaboratively and within a framework of openness and transparency. I'm intrigued by the ingenuity of future climate activists like yourselves that intend to deliver sustainability and climate action goals here in our city. You will inevitably play a crucial role in how we move forward as a generation and as a culture. Your participation in the University of Manitoba's Sustainability Day has solidified not only critical skills and experiences, but your intent and desire to lead. On behalf of His Worship, Mayor Brian Bowman, and my colleagues on City Council, thank you for your leadership, partnership, and dedication to building a resilient and sustainable planet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chambers. On behalf of the University of Manitoba, I'd like to thank Elder Wanda Murdoch, the Honorable Jeff Wharton, Mr. Chambers, President Benarash for sharing their thoughts on sustainability and sustainability day. I would also like to thank our presenters and all of you for attending today. Today is a day about sharing and celebration of our community's accomplishments and connections. Connections that help us learn from our peers and network with others within the sustainability community. Today is also a day of forward-thinking action, as our presenters share ideas about the future of sustainability. As awareness and concerns increase globally for climate and the environment, so does the importance of gathering together, discussing issues, brainstorming solutions, and strategizing plans. I'd now like to introduce Kale from the Office of Sustainability to walk you through the structure of the day. Thanks so much, Christy, and hi, everyone. It's so nice to see your names on the participant list. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the day and then talk a little bit about what the Sustainable Development Goals are. So Sustainability Day is a day of students, employees, alumni, and community members sharing their ideas, experiences, and passion for sustainability. Following this event, it's your task to take the presenters' passions and ideas and turn them into action to give our campus, city, and planet a more sustainable future. The theme of Sustainability Day 2022 is Take Action for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, often referred to as the SDGs. The day will feature 10 presentations shared by staff, students, faculty, and community members who are taking action for sustainability. Presentations will be between 15 and 20 minutes long, and after each presentation, there will be a Q&A period, question and answer period, where the presenter will answer all of your burning questions. A Q&A box can be found at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to drop your questions in during the presentation and then wait for them to be answered at the end. The day is structured so you can come and go as your schedule allows. Simply use the same link you logged into with this morning and jump back into the program at any point in time. If you wish during any presentation, you have the ability to toggle on and off your closed captions should you wish. This feature is also found at the bottom of your screen. And as Christy mentioned at the beginning, an IST staff member is standing by to assist you should you need anything at all. Following the presentations, our 2022 UM Sustainability Awards will be presented. This award nom nomination happens annually to recognize and celebrate the collaborative efforts of students, staff, and faculty to advance our campus's commitment and excellence in leadership in sustainability. It is believed that these award winners' efforts on campus demonstrate both leadership, advocacy, and a memorable and lasting impact related to the sustainable development goals. Please be sure to tune in at 2.30. So you may be wondering, what are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? The SDGs are a list of 17 goals aimed to address people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. They are an urgent call to action for countries developing and developed in global partnership. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health edu and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. 
For every goal, there's an academic hub around the world, and the University of Manitoba is the hub for goal number six, clean water and sanitation. So this allows us future, to future highlight and advance the research that we're doing here on campus, and also provides us the opportunity to network with other SDG hubs around the world. The UM is the only Canadian institution on the list. In addition to this, the university is also the hub to one of 189 SDG youth groups around the world, which aims to engage students in higher education in the global efforts to address people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. On this note, I will pass it over to Juanita to introduce our first presenter. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the day. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. On that note, I'd like to welcome Balraj Hathi and Sahan Babai from the UM SDG student group. Balraj is a fourth year student majoring in environmental studies with a focus area in sustainable development while also minoring in management. Sahand is a second year student in general sciences with the plan to enter into dentistry. The SDG student hub works under the guidance of Sustainable Development Solutions Network Youth and the UM Office of Sustainability to create a space for interdisciplinary collaboration and inclusive conversations around the sustainable development goals. Welcome, Balraj and Sahan. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And I just want to thank you, thank the Office of Sustainability for inviting us to present here today. Um, to share my screen here. Can everybody see my screen there? Okay, perfect. So uh, yeah, as we said, we're from the SDG Student Hub. I'm a fourth year student, um, minoring in management and majoring in environmental studies. And Sahan, if you want to introduce yourself a bit. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm a second year science student, and I'm so glad to be here with you guys. Hope you can have a great day. Awesome. So we'll get right into it there. Um, so I'll be talking about SDG Goal 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. I personally am very interested in SDG 11 because I feel building sustainable cities and communities can be the base for improving the progress of a lot of the other goals. All the goals are interconnected, as previously mentioned, but I believe with the increasing population of cities is an important area to address because by 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. Important areas to discuss in order to make a community more sustainable are identifying the most sustainable ways to achieve targets, building appropriate skills across stakeholder groups, securing financing, innovative designs for projects, buildings, energy, and mobility, ensuring stakeholder engagement in all stages of urban development as well. SDG, SDG targets include upgrading slums and ensuring safe and affordable housing and basic services by 2030. In improving public transport and ensuring safe and affordable housing and sustainable transport systems are also essential parts. Reducing environmental impacts of cities by focusing on waste management and air quality, access to green spaces that are inclusive and accessible for everybody, including women, children, and elders. Strengthening regional and national development planning and financially and technically supporting least developed countries to build sustainable cities and resilient buildings using local materials. So what makes a city sustainable? Um, decreasing water, energy, and natural resources efficiently, minimizing waste and increasing recycling and composting, limiting pollution to levels that don't damage natural systems. Um, another aspect is strengthening local community and cultural identity, providing safe, clean, and pleasant environments which protect human health access to food, water, and housing at reasonable costs, and empowering community members to be involved in decision-making processes. Another aspect is providing access to satisfying and rewarding work and making more opportunities for culture, leisure, and recreational activities available. And finally, minimizing the use of cars. Altogether, they help cities become more sustainable and communities become more sustainable. So the top 10 most sustainable cities um, in the world, starting at number 10, are Reykjavik, Iceland. 
what they focus on is um, eliminating the production of greenhouse gas emissions by promoting the use of public transportation. They're also promoting bicycle ridership and encouraging the use of electric vehicles. Number nine on the list is Vancouver, Canada. They produce the lowest greenhouse gas, gas emissions of all major cities in North America and have implemented the Greenest City Initiative, which focuses on realistic goals in the near future. I think this is important because it helps um, understand and helps uh, the sense of accomplishment that we've progressed further instead of having far-fetched goals. It, um, it increases the uh, momentum that is gained. Um, number eight is Helsinki, Finland. This city relies upon tourism and 75% of its uh, hotels are environmentally friendly. They also have a green district, which, which focuses on sustainability and uses solar panels and wind farms. Um, number seven on the list is Cape Town, South Africa. They promote outdoor activity with safe cycling routes. Citizen, citizens of the city are starting to grow their own vegetables and use their own solar panels as well. San Francisco takes their different direction. Um, they focus on diverting 80% of waste from landfills. And as years progress, they want to up that percentage as well. Uh, Portland, USA, 25% of people can meet by carpool, public transport, or bikes, and it has over 400 kilometers of bike paths. It also uses 33% of renewable energy. Berlin, Germany has a lot of green spaces and areas to grow your own vegetables. Also focused on electric vehicles and people are more willing to share and they're more willing to carpool, so it reduces emissions that way as well. Uh, Stockholm, Sweden, they're implementing biofuel, which is produced from sewage waste, and in turn is leading the charge in removing fossil fuel consumption by 2040. This is an approach a lot of cities can take as every city has sewage waste and they can uh, implement it by uh, producing biofuel and using it. Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands comes in at number two because cycling is a main mode of transportation. And now citizens are also installing solar panels and buying more from local farmers markets. Copenhagen, Denmark is the new number one because they plan on becoming the first carbon neutral city by 2025 and only 29% of households own car. So moving on, um, what is Winnipeg doing to become more sustainable? The city of Winnipeg's approach to re reaching SDG goal 11 includes implementing renewal, renewable energy upgrades and improving efficiency of civic owned buildings. A major part of improving sustainability is a mandate introduced in 2011 that states all new city owned buildings with additions over 50, 500 square meters and buildings receive accreditation from verified third parties such as LEED. On, in the graphic on screen, we can see a large portion of emissions by the operations of the city of Winnipeg or a result of buildings. And this way we can understand why these mandates are essential to building a sustainable city. This highlights the fact that the city of Winnipeg is setting an example for the citizens of Winnipeg that being sustainable is possible and encouraged. The city of Winnipeg is also aiming to make walking, cycling, transit the preferred mode of transportation for Winnipeggers. They aim to do so by building a transportation system that is safe, equitable, and integrated with land use. Achieving this will require a shift in the culture and views of many Winnipeggers. But by looking at the list of top 10 cities, it provides hope that Winnipeg too can become more sustainable in both its design of buildings and its transportation preferences. I'll pass it over to Sahan now. Okay, thank you, Balraj. So I want to speak about the goal number six, which is ensuring access to water and sanitation for all people around the world. The reason that I'm so interested in this goal is that around the world, there is a huge issue of water scarcity, and it is important to address that and help to overcome this problem. So as you can see, there is a substantial progress around the world for this issue, and there's a lot of things that happen to solve the problems, but still many people around the world are facing different problems for either sanitation or accessing to clean drinking water every day, which uh, statistics show that one in every three people do not have access to safe drinking water, two in every five don't have access to basic hand washing facilities, and over 633 million people still practice open devastation. Also, another statistic shows that one in four healthcare facilities lack basic water services and three in 10 people lack safely managed drinking water services. 
Also, another thing that makes me emotional every time that I say it, but it's important to pay attention, is that every day, nearly 1,000 children die because of the preventable water diarrheal diseases, which is a huge number. Every day, 1,000 people, which are children, die. So it's important to make sure we make progress to prevent all of these problems and make sure that everybody have access to this important uh, human right and have access to clean water for washing, for sanitation, and for drinking. Can we pass to the next slide? So one thing that uh, the United Nations has proposed and many countries have involved is the water action decade that started from 2018 and is going to continue until 2028. And it's planning to uh, decrease the water shortfall and make sure that we have a substantial movement towards uh, clean water facilities for everyone all around the world, especially in the parts that have uh, harder access and there's more to be done. And uh, many countries uh, from the UN General Assembly joined this action on 22nd of March 2018 and uh, are planning to help mobilize action that will help transform uh, how we manage water and make sure that we are moving in the right direction. <clears throat> So why does this uh, goal matter a lot? As you can see on the map on the screen, many countries are facing a huge water scarcity problem, especially in the regions of Asia and America. And it's important to make sure that we are moving in a direction that everyone have access to this basic human right. Uh, the demand for water is rising. And uh, in these countries, it can cause many problems and it can cause growth in different preventable diseases that can easily be solved with just a simple hand washing, just like uh, COVID-19 that we're facing in the pandemic right now. It can be decreased to a highly uh, substantial level if we just wash hands and have access to sanitation facilities. So it's important to make sure that everyone have access to clean water So what are some of the challenges that we are facing nowadays? Uh, as you know, a very obvious one is the COVID-19 pandemic that is causing critical importance for sanitation and all the sanitation devices in order to make sure we don't spread the disease. It's important to make sure that everyone have access to hygiene services and make sure that everyone can wash their hands easily without any problems and make sure that this basic human right is accessible all throughout the world. Um, it might be a guess, but if all around the world people had access to hygiene devices, there might be a helping in order to prevent rise to the new variants of COVID-19 and make sure that the pandemic would be ending sooner than we were expecting. So another problem that is uh, right now important to face is that in 2017, it was estimated that 3 billion people lacked ability to safely wash their hands at home, which is very important to solve because uh, it's nearly less than half of uh, the population of the planet. So it's important to move in the right direction in this goal and make sure that everyone all around the planet in different continents have access to all water facilities and all hygiene and sanitation facilities. So what are the goals that, uh, what are the targets that this goal is aiming to achieve? Uh, the first target is that by 2030, we want to achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for everyone. The second target is to make sure that there is access to adequate and equitable sanitation for all. And also make sure that 
we can end open deficitation, which is causing a rise in different microbial diseases. The third goal is to make sure that we improve the water quality and reduce the water pollution, eliminating dumping and minimizing the release of hazardous chemicals, especially by different factories. Uh, the fourth goal, the fourth target is to make sure that by 2030, we substantially increase water use efficiency across all sectors and ensure that sustainable withdrawals and supply of fresh water are accessible to everyone. And to address water scarcity and substantially reduce the number of people suffering from water scarcity all around the world, which is a rising problem because of the climate change and can cause many different problems, as I mentioned before. The fifth target is to make sure that we implement integrated water resources and management at all levels, including through the transportation of water to different households and facilities. The sixth target, uh, which was set for 2020, so we passed that, is to make sure that we protect and restore water-related ecosystems and including <laughs> mountains, forests, waterlands, aquifers, and lakes. And the importance of this target is that when uh, the ecosystem is changing, it may cause flus and different problems facing different uh, animals or humans and different species. So it's important to address this target and make sure there is no problem harming any species, whether plants, animals, or humans at all. So, University of Manitoba has done a great work in addressing goal number six and joined the institution of the United Nations Academic Impact and was named the UNAI Hub for Sustainable Development Goal 6 in 2018 uh, because of the researchers that did a great job in uh, addressing this goal and helping uh, research for clean water and sanitation goals. So the institutions from around the world are designated as a UNAI Hub for three-year renewable terms and UM continues its research and uh, analysis for policies for clean water and sanitation for everyone all around campuses and communities, and especially for the indigenous community. So here's an important question is what can we do? So there are many different organizations and charitable organizations that are planning to invest in water research and development and help to include everyone all around the world to have access to clean water and clean uh, hygiene facilities, uh, which we can all help those in order to achieve the goals faster. Also, another thing that we can do is to uh, generate awareness to uh, very simple things that we can do, like not to waste water or make sure that the uh, pay attention to the amount of water we use for washing or showering or uh, very basic daily tasks and make sure that we don't waste water and raise awareness to uh, preserving water resources all around the world, whether our country or the city is facing water scarcity or not. And also another way to help is to make sure that we support uh, other foundations that are planning to help these uh, targets, such as the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which are planning to end open deficitation. And also they have uh, had some different uh, presentations in expos in China and India and are planning to help this goal. And also to find out more about uh, this goal and other information, you can visit the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development page or the web page for Water Action DK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zahand. Um, I think uh, Juanita, you were saying um, it's time for questions, if there's any questions.
Thank you so much. That was really good. That was really interesting. Um, thank you to both. Um, there was a there were a couple questions that sort of touched on the same thing, and we just wanted to get an idea of what students are working on at the university to combat some of the issues you've highlighted. Um, do you have any specifics that you can talk about to the group? Um, I can go ahead with this one first. Um, so there was a uh, transportation, the transportation master plan was being reviewed this past month, I guess it was a month ago. And uh, as SDG Hub, we invited students to go out and uh, join the review and uh, give their own opinions from uh, their own experience using um, public transport and cycling systems as well. Um, I think it was the stakeholder engagement portion of the transportation master plan. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're just kind of trying to get more involved in community, trying to increase awareness to SDGs and increase um, the implementation of SDGs across Winnipeg as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just looking in the chat to see if there's anything else. Um, if anybody has anything else, there's a couple more minutes. Um, there was um, some, I mentioned about a rain barrel um for plants um if students want to join work can you just quickly touch on how they can do that and what they would do um if if students want to join the SDG hub for those that are not involved and are interested can you just touch on either of you can you go over that a little bit yeah, for sure. Um, so as the coordinator of the hub, you can just uh, simply send an email. I'll put the email in the chat as well as your Instagram page. And you can just send us a DM or send us an email just telling us why you're interested. And we can have a we can have a Zoom call about it or you can just uh, talk over email. And once you're once you want to join, you're just basically in. Uh, it might be an onboarding process, but that's going to be in the future. But for now, you just let us know that you want to join and then you'll be on the email list. You'll get the emails for all the upcoming events um, organized by us and by um, our uh, parent group and other organizations as well. But yeah, just simply, I'll put the email and the Instagram in the chat and then you just simply email us or um, direct message us. Okay, terrific, thank you. Um, are there any specific events or projects that you're offering at this time or working on that you wanna to touch on? All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for a reminder. Um, next week, we have a uh, SDG simulation game. Uh, we're hosting it with uh, mm -hmm. collaboration with the Office of Sustainability. It's uh, March 16th uh, from 4.30 to 7. And it kind of just, uh, it brings together SDGs and you kind of learn about how they're all interconnected in a fun and interactive way. And you get to meet new people, you get to network, you get to share ideas and share opinions as well. And you just kind of go through a simulation game and uh, try to make your country the most sustainable it can be, mm -hmm. basically, yeah. And we already, we, uh, we welcome you to join it's, uh, in six days now. We're excited about that. Yeah, there's, there's actually quite a few attendees, so that'll be good. Um, just quickly before we go, can you touch on the main goals for the hub in general? If you had to summarize in a, you know, a couple sentences, what are the main goals at this time? Uh, the main goals of the hub are just to promote and increase awareness of the SDGs across campus. And with that, also increase the implementation of them. So to help uh, campus become more sustainable while achieving the 17 SDGs. Um, but they are all interconnected. So working towards one also works towards another. And we believe in a collaborative environment. We believe in um, sharing your opinions, sharing your ideas. So if anybody joins or you're welcome to share your ideas on how we can make campus more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your time. Um, I think that's all the questions and all the comments that I see. Um, I, um, what, what, one last thing, what would you say to UN students who feel perhaps they're maybe out of touch with the UN SDGs, especially some of the younger students um, I know some of the younger ones myself, um, they just, uh, locally, they're just not aware and maybe they just aren't sure. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? 
Yeah, like if, no matter what your understanding of SDGs are, you're always welcome to join the SDG Student Hub. We're all, everybody's always learning. And throughout mm -hmm. the SDG Hub, will help you um, increase in your awareness, increase what you know about them. And um, like no, nobody's an expert really. And we're all just learning from each other. We're all learning from uh, different resources and stuff. And by joining the hub, we can uh, help increase your uh, awareness and understanding the SDGs. Yeah, that's right. Just start off slow, right? And just, just jump in and learn as you go, um, baby steps. Thank you so much. Um, did you have anything else to add? I think that's all the questions. We went through quite a few of them. Um, thank you for summarizing. I really appreciate it. Um, that was really informative. Um, and if anybody has anything else, they can add it to, to the chat and you're going to add your, your contact information as well. I will, yeah. Um, thank you uh, for inviting us, inviting us to the Sustainability Day once again. Thank you. Thank you yeah, for having us on. I want to remind everybody that if you had any further questions, you're all welcome to email us or DM us in the Instagram and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you both. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. to continue on um, with our next presenter. Thank you very much again to Balraj and Sahan. I'd like to welcome um, our next presenter who's Nikki Furlan and she's the Indigenous Coordinator in the Department of Community Engagement Learning, a part of the Student Engagement and Success. She's a land-based educator and project lead for the Working in Good Ways Project. Welcome, Nikki. Hello. And thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me here today. It's a pleasure to um, be able to join you and share something that our office has been working on, which is this um, Working in Good Ways framework, which is available on our website. And I'll, I'll share the link for it um, shortly. So um, I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about uh, my office. I'm going to share my um, slides quickly. Sorry, I'm just pulling that up. In the meantime, I will drop this link in. So this is a link to our website um, for the Working in Good Ways framework, and it will take you to the framework and other resources. I'll just quickly share my slides. Okay, thank you. So I'm the CEL uh, Coordinator Indigenous in the Department of Community Engaged Learning, where I work with my colleagues, uh, Annie Chen and Hera Vijagran, who couldn't be here today, um, as well as a great team of student staff to create opportunities for students to learn from and with communities. In recent years, we've placed work with Indigenous communities across the Americas at the center of our work and refocus the pedagogical aims of our programs on helping students to develop the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary for working in good ways with Indigenous communities. So uh, in that context, uh, we'd realized that there was areas of our own partnership engagement where we could improve, uh, where we were causing harms and where we weren't working in a good way, sometimes because of our institutional policies, procedures, and ways of working. So we set out to consult with our partners about how we could better work with Indigenous communities. So this framework and resources that I'll be sharing today is informed by consultations with nearly 100 individuals representing over a dozen nations, including CEL partners from Anishinaabe, Cree, Quechua, Kichimaya, and Mapuche communities. And these consultations were one part of an Indigenous initiatives funded project that set out to help our office understand how to do better with our own partnerships. They informed a useful set of principles and practices that can help guide multiple partnership contexts. So um, that's you know why I'm here today to speak with uh, everybody is because I think you know in the context of our work we'll likely be working with indigenous communities, um, and we're helping that you know this framework may be able to guide some of those partnerships. Um, so I'll leave some time for questions at the end, of course. Um, but essentially, you know what we heard and learned from our partners and others 
guided the reframing of partnership and assessment for our own office and we hope others. And what we learned was that at its core, working in good ways is about relationship. First building relationships and then taking care of them. So we talked with a lot of people in local, northern and international indigenous communities to develop this framework and resources. And we heard about dozens of good practices and seven principles for indigenous community engagement. And these seven principles are the foundation of the framework. So um, there is literacy here, uh, which means building a knowledge base to understand the context that you're working in and the experience of those you're working with. Then there is reflection here, uh, which is knowing your own story and developing a critical lens and approach to working, learning and relating in intercultural contexts. Relationship, which is building real relationships that aren't dependent on a partnership or particular initiative. There's reciprocity, which is striving to achieve balance in the circle by giving more and giving often. Um, there is a protocol, which is following specific protocols that respect Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. Humility, uh, which is recognizing community expertise and contributing as directed. And then finally, collaboration, which is engaging in Indigenous-led ways of working. We also learned about this pathway. So during those consultations, we heard that working with Indigenous partners is a journey that involves the parts that we're probably all familiar with, initiating a partnership, maintaining the partnership and closing the partnership. We also heard about two often overlooked stages, the work before the work at the beginning of that pathway um, and the relationship after the work. And I'll mainly be talking about these two sort of overlooked stages today. So within each stage, we've highlighted central principles and related practices, which you can see reflected here on the pathway inf infographic, but that's in no way exhaustive of the work that these stages call for. And so all of the principles apply in their own way to each of these stages, but you can see that relationship is a key, um, a foundational principle throughout the pathway. So today I'm going to focus on what we call the work before the work. So there's a whole lot of work that takes place before initiating a partnership. The work before the work is a period of learning, reflection, and relationship building that happens before we approach Indigenous communities with partnership opportunities. The work before the work doesn't only happen at the beginning um, or over a finite period of time or even in a straight line. So at any point, we may find that we have to circle back um, and return to the work before the work to strengthen the foundation of our relationship with Indigenous communities. So um, as I mentioned, literacy, reflection, and relationship are the foundational principles. So I'm going to sort of walk us through these. Uh, during the work before the work, we spend time developing our literacy in Indigenous content and learning about the histories, languages, and cultures of the Indigenous communities with whom we're building relationships and hope to work with in the future. And so I think this quote here um, that's shared by Filiberto Pin Pinados, um, one of our, our Yucatec Maya partners um, from Belize, I think his quote sort of frames this well, because he says, you know, um, co colonialism wasn't a, a period in time. It's not something that happened or, or that's happening, that rather it's this mindset that, you know, potentially is influencing all of our engagements with Indigenous people. So developing your literacy and Indigenous content will require you to seek out Indigenous teachers, spaces, and sources, um, learn through experience in the community, make space for Indigenous participation, it privilege, privileging Indigenous participation in those spaces, avoiding pan-Indigenous approaches, and engaging in lifelong learning. And so for each of the principles, we had commissioned some um, artwork from BIPOC artists, and um, this particular uh, pencil drawing here was prepared by um, Jason Awanzi, and it um, describes this idea of, of, of learning um, through experience and in community. Um, and so that it's not just about sort of, you know, opening books and journal articles, but actually engaging with people as part of our learning process and understanding these ways that people, you know, relate and work and learn. The work before the work is also a time for serious reflection about who we are and what it means to be a settler on Indigenous land or even an Indigenous per person working with other communities. 
and how we work and relate to the people and communities that we work with. So um, I'm just going to skip to the next slide, I think. I skipped it, there we go. So engaging in critical self-reflection is a central practice for developing self-awareness, which we believe we found and heard and learned about is crucial for working in good ways. And Indigenous partners identified several areas of critical reflection, including knowing who you are and where you come from, knowing how you may be perceived and being ready to earn people's trust rather than expecting it outright, knowing your motivation and capacity for working with Indigenous peoples and communities, knowing how you relate, communicate, and work with others, and developing your capacity to adapt and feel comfortable with Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, recognizing and challenging anti-Indigenous racism in yourself and others, recognizing and challenging settler colonialism in yourself and others, and anticipating and managing your own culture shock and debriefing needs. Um, and so this third principal area within this sort of work before the work stage is relationship. So during the work before the work, we spend time in community, earning trust and building whole relationships, becoming familiar with each other as potential partners and possibly receiving an invitation to work together. And so some of the key principles, and I'm just sort of skimming here, <clears throat> including uh, are fall within sort of two different areas. The first being building relationships. So being present in community and spending time with people, developing personal and whole relationships. And that means sharing who we are as people outside of our role and work at an institution, having fun and building friendships. And when we're lucky enough to actually be in community, spending quality time with community members, that may have no direct benefit to our work at all, um, like staying for lunch or taking a tour, going for a boat ride or a skidoo ride. Another area uh, of the relationship principle, another area of for practices, what this looks like practically is engaging in relational accountability. And so that might mean assuming institutional accountability. So regardless of our own personal motivations, we'll likely be perceived as a representative of our institution, another person in a long line of people. So be ready to take responsibility for hearing and addressing institutional harms. Um, this is also sort of uh, within here, we would follow through on our commitments, um, honoring commitments to return, for instance, you know, if we say that we're, we're going to come back to the community that we actually follow through and come back um, and then showing gratitude. So, you know, making sure if we're going to meetings that we're bringing food and um, or gifts and other things like that. So doing the work before the work helps us work in good ways with community partners. Skipping the work before the work um, and the crucial literacy reflection and relationship building that occurs during this stage can lead to harmful and exploitative attitudes and practices. In the consultations, we learned that the absence of literacy and in Indigenous content, critical self-reflection and relationship building often results in the disinterest to collaborate on the part of potential Indigenous community partners. So just quickly going back to the pathway here, I'm gonna jump sort of through these middle stages that, and, I, and again, I think the way that the principles and practices interact with those stages um, may not be the way that you expect. So I encourage you to engage with the pathway and with the framework and see sort of um, what, how we heard, you know, community partners expect that to play out. But I'm gonna sort of jump to the end of the pathway and talk with you just for a moment about the relationship after the work. Um, and so this was another stage that our consultations revealed, another sort of overlooked stage. So the decision to partner and work with Indigenous communities inherently means an openness to engaging in lifelong relationships. Some might develop into close relationships and others might not. And really it all depends on what the community wants and, and frankly, the time and effort you're, you're both willing to put in. But this last stage on the pathway is an ongoing lived commitment to supporting Indigenous communities in their struggles for resurgence, self-determination and sovereignty, and to honor this relational accountability, um, which is this set of you know, obligations and responsibilities that we have um, just by nature of being in relationship with people and sort of follow through on that relational accountability. Within the context of our work for universities, this might mean challenging and actively working to change the systems that make it difficult for, for folks um, working with Indigenous communities to work in good ways and to prioritize relationship maintenance as part of your personal and professional lives. This is another um, 
you know, piece of art that was commissioned for the framework. And it's, it's actually art that describes the reciprocity principle. Um, and so what it was depicting was this story that we were, that we heard from um, one of the, one of the uh, people on campus that we uh, consulted with. And she described reciprocity as this sort of the circle of tension right around partners that you're always sort of trying to balance out into a circle, but it's never, you know, it's, it's never quite going to be a circle because, um, you know, as an institutional partner, we, we have, we should be, and we have to work harder to maintain that reciprocity. So the framework is supported by all these other resources, as I, as I mentioned, and you may have already sort of, you know, glanced at the website. And if not, I do encourage you to do it. But these other resources are also available for download on that website. So <clears throat> the learning exercises that are suggested at the end of each principal chapter are contained within the, the practitioner workbook, um, which is available as a separate download. So the workbook is a collection of exercises that help you reflect on the principles and engage with the practices, including literacy homework, reflection worksheets, relationship mapping exercises, and more. The relational assessment guide is also available as a separate download. It's a self-reflection tool and a conversation guide for assessing the relationships at the center of our university community partnerships. And so relational assessment um, really means paying attention to and assessing the well-being of your relationships. Um, and so it differs from program evaluation. It's focused on the health and quality of your relationships rather than sort of the success or impacts of a program. Um, and then finally, of course, the pathway infographic is also there um, available for download. So I just wanted to say thank you and open it up to questions. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen, but I can drop links in after. Thank you, Nikki. That was really great. That's um, you made it really clear, concise. Um, that was really informative. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the chat. Do you have other resources or events you would recommend for UN students and staff to learn more um, to, to yeah. begin to do the work before <laughs> yeah. the work? That would be the first thing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's there there are many opportunities on campus. I think to start, you know, to begin developing our literacy and Indigenous content, and as well as to start that sort of process of critical reflection. And so, you know, I think off the top of my head, some of the events, you know, some Indigenous events and Indigenous spaces on campus that welcome non-Indigenous participation include things like fireside chats. Um, the the Indigenous Studies Colloquium series is another opportunity to learn. Um, you know, from Indigenous people about Indigenous uh, matters of importance. Um, another opportunity would be the Indigenous Scholar Speaker Series. Um, and then I think, you know, even other, other spaces on campus, like for instance, Magizzi Agamic or the Indigenous Student Center, um, you know, are, are open and available for non-Indigenous people to go and make use of that space as a study space or, or what have you. And so, I mean, I encourage people to go mm -hmm. there and actually as part of our practitioner workbook, um, as I had mentioned, sort of each of the exercises in that guide link up with the chapter and um, the, the practitioner workbook exercise for the relationship chapter talks about going to visit these places and some of the things that you should think about and also how some of the principles might play out in those interactions. So, you know, if you go to um, fireside chats, for instance, are there protocols that apply? What do those protocols look like? You know, how do you, are you supposed to bring tobacco? So. I mean, they just some, pose some interesting questions for folks to think about so that they feel like they're starting to engage in a good way while they're building their literacy. Exactly, very key, agree. Thank you so much. Um, do you, uh, there was a question here. Do you have any stories from the engagement process that you might feel comfortable sharing that really stuck out to you and helped maybe shape the document? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know what? We had a lot of experiences during the consultation and um, you know, what, What's really interesting is like how, you know, I mean, I, I think we have to be willing in our engagement to make mistakes. And I think that, you know, having this um, foundation the, of, you know, doing the work before the work, having a foundation of literacy, having, you know, reflected, done some critical self-reflection and built relationships, those are going to actually, you know, sustain you through that mistake making process that you're going to do because nobody's a perfect community engager in particular when they're working outside of their own community. 
And so I have lots of stories from the engagement, often with me, you know, doing something wrong, right? And then, and then how much I learned from that process. So one example that really sticks out to me was that my colleague and I, Annie, were, you know, driving um, to an, a, a Cree community in northern Manitoba to, for, a, for, a, for a consultations that we were having about the Working in Good Ways pro project. Um, and we arrived at this meeting. It was a large meeting, you know, we had scheduled in advance. I think there was about 10 folks or something there. And so Annie and I show up like fully empty handed into this meeting thinking we're just going to write them a check after, right? Like we're just going to send them a, you know, community honorarium. They can, you know, use it however they want. So we show up to the meeting and we sit down and the this first thing this one woman says to us is, oh, you didn't bring any donuts. And, you know, Annie and I just looked at each other like, you know, we were so embarrassed and she was definitely teasing us, but there, there's a, there was like a measure of truth to it as well, right? She was chiding us about the fact that we're coming here to talk about, you know, how do you work in good ways and food being the central principle and we hadn't brought coffee or food or anything. So I'll be honest, the meeting was a little awkward and difficult to get through, but we learned so much from that meeting. And frankly, they invited us to stay for lunch after. And, and at that point, you know, over lunch while we were sharing food, things changed and folks started to be really, you know, honest about their experiences of working with the university. And I think we gleaned so much, you know, not only from the meeting, but from the lunch itself. And then, you know, we made promises to return to that community to share back what we'd heard and to visit again. And we honored those, you know, we honored that um, promise we made and we returned a few months later to share back. And this time, you know, I brought the coffee, I brought the donuts and we were laughing about it. But but again, I think you make mistakes and I think you have this relationship and this literacy that will sort of help you move past those um, issues with community. I agree hundred percent. And doesn't that just go to show the importance of food, right? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> to just, you know, you know, cut, cut, like just make things easier, like just mm -hmm. break the ice, right? Um, Exactly. Nikki, there's a question here in the chat. Um, do you think the university processes deprive or obstruct the human connection required to meaningful engage, meaningful engagement with Indigenous communities? And do you have suggestions? Yeah, absolutely. So I I do think that um, that you know our the sort of university, the institutional protocols that we have, our institutional you know policies and processes. Um, and generally, you know, are, are sort of the, 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 I mean, there's no other way to say it, this colonial ways of working that we have um, definitely impact our relationship building with communities mm -hmm. in a lot of way. And sort of one, you know, one way that's just jumping out to me, and of course, I mean, there, we list many ways that this happens in the framework. But I think one of the ways is really is time, right? The, the sort of the, the different values on time and relationship um, that Indigenous people, and I'm, I mean, I'm painting with a wide brush here, folks, right? But that Indigenous folks have, you know, that maybe us coming from a, this sort of institution do not have. So, you know, we want to show up to a meeting and say, well, here's the agenda. Okay, we've got 30 minutes. We're going to go through six items and, you know, and then it's going to be done and I'm going to leave. But I think, you know, what we heard um, and learned in the consultations mm -hmm. is that Indigenous communities don't want to work this way, right? Like, that, you know, that this idea of coming in with this agenda and having these short meetings, it's not conducive at all to relationship building. You know, folks wanna be able to sit down, chat, you know, get to know you a little bit, and including beyond your role and work in the institution. And so I think that's just sort of one example of ways that, you know, our ways of working just don't, don't align and why we need to do the work of adapting our behavior. Um, and so one of the ways that we have sort of worked in some of these, um, some of these challenges into the framework is that at the end of each chapter, we list systems changes. So we actually say, these are the, you know, these are some of the challenges at the university level um, that might inhibit us, you know, really implementing these principles and practices in the ways Indigenous communities might expect us to. And so, for instance, tied into this story that I just told you, this sort of, you know, difference in values between time and relationship, the kinds of system change that we, you know, suggest that are required are things like really building in relationship building and relationship maintenance into our job descriptions. So they become part of our work, right? And uh, like a, an expected part of our work um, and, and things like that, right? So we've, we've made mm -hmm. some of those suggestions at the end of the chapter. So again, I, I encourage you to sort of pour through that document and see 
um, and and to look at some of those system changes we've we've called for. Thank you. Yeah, no, very beneficial. And um, you're right. You, you touched on that personal connection, right? Mm -hmm. To move forward, you need everybody works better with that established. Right. Some sort of a personal connection first, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you. Um, else is there let's see there was a couple more questions to you is there um an initial activity that you could that they could walk participants through or describe like something initial um sure is that yeah, a little bit I, vague maybe <laughs> yeah something something a little vague maybe okay so okay so for instance um within sort of the uh, within the practitioner's workbook, there are, you know, about eight or 10 activities or so. And one of the activities was um, developed by my colleague, Annie Chen, and it's called relational introductions. And the, the idea behind the activity was that, you know, we often, when we're meeting new people, we, especially in the context of our work, of course, that we often introduce ourselves in that context. So I tell them, you know, maybe about my educational background, I tell them about my work background, and I generally am going to be talking about my work rather than introducing myself at all in a personal way. And so what we learned in our consultations is that Indigenous folks were not introducing themselves to us in that way, right? When we were meeting people, even in the context of their work, um, they were talking about, you know, who they were, their families, their sort of hobbies and passions. And then we we're on the other side going like, I work at the university in the Department of CL. And so we realized there was this sort of disconnect, mm -hmm. even in just the ways that we initially are relating to each other, literally in our introduction. So Annie designed an activity that gets people to sort of think through um, their own relationships to land in place, including their migration stories mm. um, and, and sort of these, uh, these other, you know, questions, these sort of critical reflection questions designed to get folks to start thinking about, you know, who they are and what kind of information they want to share. And the impetus behind the activity was in part because, um, I hope she doesn't mind, I'll share her story really quickly, but she was at a community event one time, an Indigenous event, and she had been approached by a well-known elder, and the elder said, oh, where are you from? And Annie, Annie's a Chinese-born Canadian, um, or Canadian-born Chinese woman, sorry, and uh, so she said, I'm from Winnipeg. And this elder sort of looked at her, kind of gave her a, like a funny look and then just walked away and didn't say anything else. And so Annie realized in that moment, that's not what the woman wanted to hear, right? The elder, you know, wanted to hear this sort of migration story of where her family had come from mm -hmm. and where her other roots were um, and to sort of learn more about her than sort of this, you know, this sort of really surface level thing mm -hmm. we generally tell people really quick when we're meeting them. So that was also sort of informing the creation of this activity. So the activity is several pages long. I couldn't necessarily walk you through it, but it sort of gets you to start thinking about some of these things that we may want to share. And then at the end of the exercise to sort of write yourself a what we call a relational introduction. So a way of introducing yourself that is rather than being professional, that's relational mm -hmm. and personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As if you were, yeah, introducing yourself to a group of friends, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Take a step yeah, back it. and re-examine. Yeah. 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 You know, take off that professional hat for a second and really dive in differently, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Super important. Thank you. Um, do we have time for another one? I think um, there is time for one or two more and there's a couple okay. here. Um, can you speak to how working in good ways links with the University Indigenous Planning and Design Principles? Oh, that's a toughie. Yeah. Um, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, I guess that's a very difficult question. So I don't think I'm going to be able to, you know, answer it perfectly because I'm not, you know, super, very closely familiar with the Indigenous um, design principles. Uh, but that being said, I think, you know, what's, what the um, framework would sort of, what, what sort of brings to that, again, is this like, this focus on, um, like there was a lot of principles that I wasn't able to share with you that again are take a more sort of central 
you know, position in those middle stages that I kind of skimmed over. But some of them that are really jumping to mind again are things like reciprocity, protocol, humility, and collaboration. And so when you think about, for instance, just off the top of my head, the principles of humility and collaboration, humility means, you know, realizing that we're not always the experts in all of the situations, right? That, that the communities that we're working with, the Indigenous people, you know, individuals, communities, or organizations that we work with are also experts, right? Are experts not only on their own lives, but are experts in, you know, in, in engineering, in mm -hmm. geology, in other, you know, biology, other layers of science and governance and education. And I think starting to understand, right, that that they have all this expertise and that there are some moments, right, where we step back and we like listen and integrate as much as possible everything that we're learning. And I think the collabor collaboration principle sort of, you know, underpins this too by saying that, you know, our work has to be Indigenous led and Indigenous centered. And so, you know, as much as we, we want to be sort of, you know, the, the kind of people guiding this thing, that what we heard is that it should be Indigenous peoples guiding our community. So that's a really roundabout way, I think, of me saying that with the Indigenous design principles, you know, are developed um, through a process that was like Indigenous led and Indigenous centered, then I think like, you know, they have this value of being like, this is Indigenous expertise. This is based on this like deep Indigenous knowledge, right? So anyways, I don't think I really answered that question very well, but that's my stab at it with the little that I know. <laughs> no, it was great. No, that I think you did a good job. That was kind of, that was a little bit of a tough question, yeah. um, but we were just, yeah, I know that that's interesting for all of us to just get a sense of some of the links. Um, um, yeah, just getting a sense of that background work mm -hmm. and sharing it with us because um, a lot of those principles are very similar. So thank you. Thank you. Um, just let me check for any other questions. I think that we might we done all of them. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, is there anything else that was really fantastic? Um, yeah, you know what? There was a little couple of comments about thanking you again for talking about those connections um, that you did just a bit ago because personal mm -hmm. relationships. Um, I like like in my workplace. That's so key to me to work together harmoniously. And it, it has been frowned upon in a lot of workplaces. Mm -hmm. So just reiterating how important those are is, yeah, is right. just really helpful and refreshing. Yeah. Um, and it's good to just say that over and over again, right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And in the long run, it benefits everybody. Um, so thank you for sharing all of your work and yeah, all the resources and the guides and, um, and uh, reminding us to take a to, to look at it and to just dive in. So I'm excited to do that myself. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a great, My pleasure. Have a great, um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Thanks again, Nikki, for that uh, excellent presentation. Next up, we have a presentation from Michaela Payson and Vanessa Jukestret titled Intertwined, Sharing Stories and Learning from the Land. Michaela Payson is a graduate student enrolled in the Master of Landscape Architecture program at the University of Manitoba. Her practicum research focuses on revealing, just one moment here, sorry, revealing Afro-Caribbean narratives in Canada's landscape, the untold stories of our collective history. Previously, Michaela worked with the Office of Sustainability before accepting her current position with HTFC Planning and Design as a junior landscape designer. Vanessa Jukestret is a landscape architect, architect and project manager with Physical Plant Architectural and Engineering Services at the University of Manitoba. Vanessa's project portfolio primarily includes infrastructure renewal and public realm development for all UM campuses. She is the current president of the Manitoba Association of Landscape Architects Please join me in welcoming Michaela and Vanessa to the online stage. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Michaela, just to confirm, would you like me to share screen? Or are you set? That would be great. Thank you so much, okay. Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Jesse. OK. 
Okay, hopefully um, everyone can see this here. And I'm just going to attempt. All right. Uh, is that showing uh, for you, Michaela? Yeah, it looks good, Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you. We had a little technical switch happen here. So uh, <laughs> thanks for bearing with us. Um, Happy you made it safe and Michaela, lovely to see you. <laughs> lovely to see you um, too. <laughs> so as uh, Jesse mentioned, uh, the title of our presentation today is Intertwined, Sharing Stories and Learning from the Land. Uh, we're going to share with you a couple of projects that Michaela and I have worked on um, at the university and, uh, and how these projects overlapped. Um, and we, um, we built our relationship uh, together working collaboratively at the university. So I will uh, pass it off to Michaela and I'm going to um, actually, to start, we're going to just share a little overview of a, a video of a site on campus, um, and, uh, and then we'll carry on with the presentation. Okay, I'm going to stop the video there uh, and we'll speak to this a little bit further on and pass it off to Michaela to share a bit about how this presentation uh, will connect to the SDGs. Okay, so uh, for today, we wanted to highlight uh, a few sustainable development goals that we felt really strongly aligned with the projects that Vanessa and myself have been working on. Although we could make connection to all of them, we felt these were the strongest ones. So goal three, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. Um, as we get through the projects, you'll be able to see that that's been a goal for all of the projects. Um, we want everyone to be able to come to these spaces, enjoy them, um, and promote health and well-being in these spaces. Uh, goal nine, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. That's very well aligns with Vanessa's portfolio, and you'll see that as she begins to introduce the Eastern Transportation Corridor. Uh, goal 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Uh, we felt this is very integral and should be at the top of everyone's mind in any uh, project, especially in landscape architecture moving forward in this day and age. Uh, goal 15, protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. Uh, through both these projects, we're promoting uh, the use of uh, native species and uh, sort of repairing the riparian habitat along the University of Manitoba corridor. Uh, goal 16 is promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. We feel this really aligns with the university's goals overall, um, and you'll be able to see how we're trying to promote um, inclusivity and partnership through these projects. Thanks, Michaela. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, I would like to take the opportunity to share with all of you an area of the Fort Erie campus um, and the work that has taken place over the last few years. We currently, currently refer to this area as the Eastern Transportation Corridor or the ETC. Uh, area improvements have been phased in over the last few years with road renewal, tree planting, 
native prairie revegetation, a multi-use path, and future plans for seeding, signage, and wayfinding. So here on the screen, you will see the location of the ETC. For context, um, the admin building and the quad are here in the center of the air photo. Uh, the Red River is along the north and south sides, anchoring the corridor, and the point lands are to the east. So here's the corridor off to the side. The ETC is comprised of Friedman Crescent, running east-west along the south side of campus. Saunderson Street is going north-south, adjacent to the point lands, and Dysart Road is running east-west on the north side of campus. This map here illustrates the connection of the, the connections of the ETC multi-use path, which is the magenta dotted line, to some of the other pedestrian and cycling facilities on campus. On the south end, the path links to the sidewalk along Friedman Crescent, which connects to the Trans-Canada Trail at Kings Drive, which is the solid yellow line. On the north side of campus at the Wallace Building, we're projecting a future connection, uh, the dark blue dotted line, to lead to Southwood Lands and connect back to the Trans-Canada Trail linking up to Darcy Drive. So here's a view of Saunderson Street from 2017. This area was historically characterized by golden willows that lined Saunderson Street. The post-mature willows were removed in the spring of 2018 following arborist recommendations due to late life decay, which had been observed for over a decade. All the willows along the corridor displayed the common patterns of decline associated with this species, which typically exhibit fast growth and short life. In 2018, road reconstruction commenced with the complete renewal of Saunderson Street. 2019, dike stabilization and the construction of the multi-use path started. Native revegetation work began in 2020 with weed control and site preparation. Native seeding is scheduled for this year. The consultant team for these projects is KGS Group and Scatliff Miller Murray. And prior to their engagement, preliminary design concepts for the area were developed by Public City Architecture. In the fall of 2020, 230 trees were planted on the site. Here's a photo taken after the road construction was completed. The view is looking north from the roadway. Now we're changing views. So this is a view of a multi-use path during construction. The view is looking south and off into the distance is the Plant Science Field Station. And up on the right-hand side of the screen is Saunderson Street, which is part of the city of Winnipeg's primary dike. Now we're looking back north during the cover crop seeding in 2020, which is part of the weed control for the native revegetation on site. Off to the east is the point lands. In this photo, you can see the cover crop starting to germinate. So here's the tree planting plan from 2020. The initial planting is intended to serve as a base planting for the site, while future design concepts for the area are considered. You can see that the primary focus of the planting plan was to highlight species native to Manitoba, including bur oak, Manitoba maple, cottonwood, and hackberry, among others. Willow has been reintroduced to the site and can be found at both the north and south gate gateways of the corridor. A few showing mountain ash can also be found as you approach the seating and wayfinding spaces, from the south as a way to signify a change in the pathway and a destination point. I also wanted to add that 75 of these trees were planted in support of an initiative entitled 75 Trees for the 75 Years of the UN, which commemorated the 75th anniversary of the United Nations in 2020. This initiative aligns with the SDG, SDG Goal 7, affordable and clean energy, and contributes to the reforestation of the planet as each year, approximately 12 million hectares of forest are destroyed. So here's a view looking north along the, and along the left-hand side uh, is a row of hybrid American elm, which lined the corridor all the way up to the north uh, side where planting transitions into burr oak along the roadway. Here's a view looking northeast to the south, um, next to the south seating node, and that's that space on, on the side of your screen. Now we've jumped along uh, to the north side of the site and we're looking west, Robson Hall, you can see there on your left-hand side, and you can see the Burr Oak, which lined Dysart Road. Off in the distance, you can see Chancellor's Hall, which many of you know is home to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Here on the north side, um, in contrast to the south, where I started with the photos, uh, you can see that the, the tree planting evolves from a linear geometry lining the path into a more organic form, which ties into the riparian corridor of the Red River. And here's the last seating and wayfinding space on the north side. 
of the three spaces, uh, this one has a very different view from the other two further south, uh, which primarily, primarily have views out to the point lands. And here we're looking out to the Red River. Um, and then just before I pass it off to Michaela, uh, the University of Manitoba's Indigenous Planning and Design Principles, um, as we've mentioned in the previous presentations, were established to guide planning and design on all university lands and campuses, and will guide the future development of the site. As the principles highlight, effective planning must recognize that all components of a place, land, water, transportation networks, buildings, infrastructure, open spaces, and the people that inhabit it are linked in complex ways. Each one affects the other, and they must be viewed holistically. We'll speak to this a little bit further as Michaela takes over and shares a bit about her project. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, so now we'll transition over to Raven Medicine Cloud, uh, which was a name gifted to us for the project by Elder Stella Blackbird. As part of its commitment to strengthen relationships, honor the past and build community, UM established the Indigenous Initiatives Fund. As a grant recipient, the Office of Sustainability set out to explore land-based Indigenous values and create a platform that conveys the understanding and awareness of these values. The Indigenous story map focuses on select landscape elements that are currently found along the University of Manitoba uh, Riverbank Forest. Information about these elements is presented to communicate and demonstrate the land-based values of Indigenous communities while building awareness of Indigenous knowledges, cultures, and traditions. To help guide and provide advice on developing an Indigenous story map, the Office of Sustainability developed an Indigenous land-based knowledge working group using the framework of the Indigenous planning and design principles. This group is comprised of key campus and external stakeholders with influence from Elder Stella Blackbird and Elder Audrey Bone. The vegetation in this story map is found at the University of Manitoba and identified in the biodiversity baseline study and assessment, an investigation to characterize the river bottom forests of the University of Manitoba campus lands. During this assessment, surveys were undertaken to determine the overall biodiversity of the forest environments with a focus on vegetative communities and the habitat that they provide. Numerous plant species identified within the project assessment areas were well-documented species of cultural importance for local Indigenous peoples. This report then provided the basis of understanding the Indigenous vegetation and habitat traditionally used for medicine, substance, and cultural purposes still present in the riparian forest today. After reviewing this report, the Indigenous Land-Based Knowledge Working Group selected the species of rabid medicine cloud as important species to Indigenous cultures in Manitoba. This project is dedicated in loving memory of Elder Stella Blackbird, Red Eagle Woman of the Turtle Clan. The University of Manitoba is truly blessed that she shared her love and knowledge as an elder, medicine teacher, and traditional healer within the community. Elder Stella will continue to guide us as her teachings live on. The following images, information, and maps communicate and demonstrate the land-based values of Indigenous communities while building awareness of Indigenous knowledges, cultures, and traditions at the University. These images will be physically displayed at the University in the coming years. The information below re represents only a small portion of many extensive Indigenous teachings that exist. Teachings vary from region and from nation to nation. And for more information, we highly recommend and encourage consulting with a traditional elder, medicine person, or healer in the appropriate manner. Plants are not objects, they are beings. They are connected to each and every one of us. They are all of our relations. The ecological elements found in the riparian forest contribute to community building, carrying languages forward, and sustaining a specific way of life. The elements contribute to the function of the larger ecosystem and support activities such as hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering. We are part of the nutrient and carbon cycles, are as the plants and animals. These ecological elements are an aspect of traditional knowledges recognized by Indigenous peoples. So tying back to the video we shared um, at the start of the presentation, on May 13th and 14th, 2021, the Office of Sustainability and Architectural and Engineering Services hosted a virtual collaborative workshop experience to help reimagine the spaces of the ETC. UM undergraduate and graduate students, faculty, staff, and alumni were invited to participate. The 
The planning and framework for the collaborative workshop was guided by the by the, inv <laughs> the invaluable contributions of the steering committee listed here. The interdisciplinary two-day workshop encouraged participants to reimagine the spaces along the ETC by integrating the Indigenous planning and design principles into their ideas and concepts for the future planning and design of the corridor. I'll pass it off to Michaela if you'd like to share a little bit more about the outcomes um, and themes of the workshop. So four essential themes frame the two-day workshop. Cultural landscape, history of this place, water, ecologies, and creative expressions on and for the land. Dun Duncan Mercury, Poet Laureate of Winnipeg through 2022, and Di Brandt, Inaugural Poet Laureate of Winnipeg uh, from 2018 to 2019, weaved a series of their poems throughout the workshop, linking poetry with design while inspiring storytelling throughout. Shown here are word clouds, which were created after each theme's presentation, when participants were asked to document the first words or emotions that came to mind. The visual representation gives greater prominence to words that appear more frequently, depicted by font size and color. Participants were encouraged to connect with the site and landscape elements while celebrating native prairie vegetation and its important role in Indigenous cultures. Breakout sessions integrated the four essential themes, allowing students to create a collaborative, inclusive environment for exploration and analysis. I'll pass it back to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Michaela. Uh, so in the workshop, participants considered ideas and concepts for the three seating and wayfinding spaces along the multi-use path and discussed strategies for the overall wayfinding and interpretive signage along the corridor. Presentations and guidance from mentors, including members from the Indigenous campus community, faculty, and industry professionals supported students in creating their proposals. Participants documented their ideas under three key concepts, which are shown here, people and connections, water, flora, and fauna. And we've shared here a few highlights under each of those concepts that were generated and shared by the participants. A document was compiled and summarizes the events and outcomes of the workshop. And more information on the event, as well as the Eastern Transportation Corridor, can be found in UM today with a simple search of Eastern Transportation Corridor. And with that, we would like to say thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing us to share this space with you um, and happy to uh, answer any questions um, that folks may have. Thank you, Vanessa and Michaela, for that uh, wonderful presentation. I'm looking forward to exploring the Eastern Transportation Corridor a little bit more uh, as the snow starts to melt. I did a little bit of a, a walk out there um, in, in the winter, and uh, it, was, it was snowy, but enjoyable. I'm just going to take a look here to see, to see some of the questions that might be coming in. And, Participants are again reminded, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A uh, box. While we wait for those to come in, I had a few of my own. Um, you know, looking at some of the beautiful trees that have been planted along this, this uh, pathway, I wondered what the university's plans are to, um, to help nurture those those trees to continue to grow uh, through the next couple of years. I know sometimes trees can be pretty vulnerable in their first few years of, uh, of planting. So I just wanted to hear more about that. That's great. I'm happy to share about this. Uh, so for the first time on the university campus is we've introduced what they call tree watering bags. Um, so if you spent time out in the area over the last year or so, you would have seen these black bags um, that are uh, attached around the base of the tree. And those will be filled with water. Um, a watering truck takes quite a bit of water to water these trees. Uh, and so we hoped to create a system that would help slow um, the watering process and uh, allow that to take place over many hours. Um, so that's one of the aspects that we've introduced and actually started um, to, to introduce it on other sites on campus as well. Um, we, we have noticed uh, a significant amount of animal damage, uh, deer in particular, uh, rubbing at the trees, which has caused some stress uh, 
and, um, and to the demise of a few of the species. So we will be uh, replanting some of those that, that may not uh, survive that damage uh, and looking at new ways to introduce other mechanisms. So multiple stakes, uh, we realized after the fact that it might have been uh, beneficial to have multiple stakes added um, around the trees to, to prevent the wildlife from getting close. Um, and, uh, and in other areas on campus, we've also done some, some wire mesh around those stakes, just as the trees become established uh, to help to deter any uh, wildlife damage. But uh, unfortunately, I think this spring we will see um, some of the trees not leaping out uh, simply due to uh, the increase in wildlife on campus that we're experiencing as there's low uh, capacity and low numbers. So uh, you'll see a few more deer and many rabbits <laughs> uh, around campus, at the Fort Ferry campus right now. Oh, and I did want to apologize. I'm sorry, folks, that there was no video or there was no audio in the video at the beginning. Um, I, <laughs> I didn't realize uh, and I didn't happen to see the chat, but uh, what you would have heard was uh, Di Brandt um, uh, was uh, doing the audio for the video and sharing River People um, as, part of the, um, as part of the promotional materials that we shared for the collaborative workshop last, uh, last May. So it's still floating out there. Um, I encourage everyone to take a look. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful piece. So uh, thanks. I think someone popped that in the chat. So thank you. <laughs> thanks, Vanessa. Uh, and good to hear some of the plans to, to try to protect some of those trees as they start to uh, grow this spring. There has been some uh, keen interest in the Raven Medicine Cloud project and learning more. Um, a few questions have come in on that project. Uh, one asking if the focus has been um, mostly on the plants that have been established in the area uh, and incorporating Indigenous knowledge around those plants or um, plants that, that are already available, um, not available, but uh, found in the area. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the Raven Medicine Cloud Project? Of course, yeah. Uh, so the basis for the project was to identify those species that are currently present. Um, in the riparian forest at the University of Manitoba so that people could go out and see what it is in its environment and learn more about that species um, from an ecological, ecological perspective, but also from understanding the importance to Indigenous cultures um, and hoping that by building this framework in projects like Vanessa's working on in, um, in the future that those can begin to be incorporated um, within um, the native root vegetation uh, just because we know that they can thrive and they are thriving in the riparian forest. Um, so trying to increase the di diversity of those uh, species is hopefully the future goals of Raven Medicine Cloud. It's great to hear. Uh, there's also a few questions coming in about the design charrette uh, in itself. Specifically, uh, you know, one comment, this looks like such a lovely place to visit. What do you envision these nodes looking like going forward? Um, where will it follow the three themes in the design charrette? I just wanted to, to know a little bit more about those nodes and what's to come. Uh, yes, most definitely. So some of the themes that evolved out of the design charrette um, and the collaborative workshop focused on creating uh, unique spaces that encourage uh, sharing and storytelling and ways to get to know one another as you pause along your route uh, through the space. Uh, we would like to carry on uh, the um, Indigenous engagement and inclusion for the project. Um, as Nikki mentioned in her presentation, focusing on centering Indigenous content throughout uh, the development of this site um, will be key in moving it forward and becoming a, a shared space across the campus for all, all users. Um, so that will remain at the foundation of the site development. Um, and we are looking to, to hopefully advance that through engagement of um, additional working groups uh, for campus stakeholders, as well as uh, consultant teams moving forward um, and hopefully some uh, cross disciplinary engagement and both student and professional uh, engagement in the project. So stay tuned. I don't have anything more concrete to share with you, um, but but certainly uh, feel free to reach out at me uh, to me anytime uh, to hear more and, and become engaged in the project as we move forward with uh, future phases. Thanks, Vanessa. I'm looking forward to, to learning more and uh, seeing seeing those developments happen. 
Michaela, a question specifically for you. Uh, can you describe your experience working as a student with multiple stakeholders on this project? Uh, I thought it was really fantastic. Um, an opportunity that I hope every student gets to experience. Um, it helped not only like my professional development, um, but also my personal growth as well. Um, and exploring um, my practicum as well, and hopefully creating those connections that I could bring in uh, in the future um, to create more inclusive spaces on the campus and also just in Manitoba at large. So it was really great. I learned so much um, and I hope to continue those relationships. That's great to hear. Do you have any tips for students who are looking into a, a you know a project that might be similar in in um, scope or design and how they might be able to get started on something like that? Uh, like similar scope to Raven Medicine Cloud and working with stakeholders. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would say uh, reach out to the Office of Sustainability and to Vanessa. Uh, they're really great at um, being able to build those connections and make those bridges. Um, even just the Office of Sustainability in general, even before um, working there, it was a great resource to go to to um, understand what has already been like developed on campus and understanding the research that's been put forward. Um, and it helps you to identify those gaps and where you may be able to input your own research and sort of advance that. Um, so definitely just branching out on campus and using the resources that are readily available um, and sort of building your awareness on what resources are available. Um, there's just so many that are popping up all the time and it's always changing. So just speaking to even your professors, um, they could be a great resource for that as well too. Great tips. Thanks, Michaela. And the Office of Sustainability is always keen to hear from, from students. One more question coming in here. What are some takeaways or favorite aspects uh, each of you could share with the group as you moved through this living project with so many different people involved? Well, I can share. I, th I, th I think kind of key to all of this has been building relationships across campus. Um, it's certainly something that I, I value in my role at the university. Um, I, I had the opportunity to participate in uh, many of the Working in Good Ways um, workshops uh, that were held uh, with the project that Nikki shared previously, if you had a chance to see her presentation. Um, and through that process, a lot of uh, just self-guided learning and um, engagement and, and being willing to listen uh, and uh, listen to our peers and our colleagues and all of the, the wonderful folks um, that are here on campus willing to share their knowledge and their experiences with you. So that has remained the foundation of the work that I do uh, and maintaining those relationships and, and reconnecting with folks as we go forward with these projects, um, I think is, is crucial to, to the richness that they will provide the campus. Um, something that sticks out in my mind uh, as I always refer back to for projects I'm involved in, I heard um, in a session uh, a student had commented that they don't feel welcome in some of the campus spaces. Uh, and that resonates strongly with me every time I start a project as to how we could create spaces that are more inclusive uh, to all campus users, whether you be a student, staff, faculty, or visitor to the campus. Uh, I think that sticks with me. And I think that's really at the root of building relationships and understanding and listening to each other uh, and, uh, and recognizing what we bring to our relationships. So I think that's probably the foundation for me. I would have to strongly agree with uh, everything that Vanessa said there. Um, relationships for sure. And everyone's story. I thought everyone brought a really unique uh, and beautiful story to the table and just allowing people to have that space to um, feel safe to share was really wonderful as well too. Um, and I really appreciated the integration of poetry into the workshop as well too is really unique um, and it really highlighted that interdisciplinary aspect of the workshop. Um, so it was such a great learning experience um, and I really hold all of those relationships and stories dear to my heart. Um, and I hope that there can be more opportunities for that in the future, um, because you really start to learn who you are and who everyone else is um, when you have those safe spaces to share. Well, thanks so much. Um, there are a few links in the chat if anyone would like to learn more about the Raven Medicine Cloud project. 
as well as take a look at that video again uh, from the Eastern Transportation Corridor workshop and design charrette. Thanks so much, Vanessa and Michaela, for a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Next up, we have Tino Dogo and Brooke Rivard to present on sustainability programming in AMSU operations. Tino is a fourth year biological sciences and political studies minor student at the University of Manitoba. He's an international student from Zimbabwe, and he is currently the AMSU VP of community engagement. In his role, he also serves as the chair of the AMSU green team. Brooke Rivard is a fifth year mechanical engineering student at the University of Manitoba with a passion for sustainability. He's originally from Calgary. He is currently the UMSU VP of Finance and Operations, and in his role, he serves as the sustainability lead at UMSU. So welcome, Tino and Brooke. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. And hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you all. And um, yeah, we're excited to present on what UMSU sort of does for sustainability. But while I get that set up here, I'll Brooke can say a quick hello. Right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introducing introduction, Jesse. And yeah, super excited to be here, super excited to talk about what AMSU has been doing, what we're currently doing, and some of our plans going forward into the future with hopefully a return to normalcy, knock on wood, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, let's get into it. Awesome. All right. Um... Can we all see the screen? I think that's always a good sort of first question to ask. We had thumbs up or Brooke, you can see the screen. Good. Yeah. yeah okay. It. All right. Awesome. Okay. So in talking to Brooke about how we would approach this presentation, we thought that the best way to do it would be by presenting to you AMSU's sustainability mandate, which was passed by the board of directors in 2020, I believe it would have been. And essentially the mandate itself splits our kind of approach to sustainability into four sections. And what we would like to do today is take you through those four, I guess, primary areas uh, with of course the understanding that uh, this was passed in 2020 and it's been a very different world since March 2020 and some of the things that we've done have deviated a little bit from what was in the mandate at that time, but we've been happy to find and come to see that a lot of the work that we've done does fit into the scope of the mandate itself. So yeah, we're very excited to take you through that. Okay, all right, but really quick, just before we get into it, another quick introduction, because there's already been one. I'm Tino, and I'm the AMSU VP Community Engagement. And just like Brooke, I have a passion for sustainability, and I've always been involved with science in one capacity or another for a long time, so much so that unfortunately I did um, blow up the electricity to the science building the one time and totally my bad there, but it's always a fun little story to share. and. Real quick, my job at AMSU is related to communications, marketing, and events, what, whatever <laughs> events we can have with the current situation that we have, but um, it also extends into partnerships and sponsorships and collaborations with other students. So yeah, and that's a picture of me in a tree. <laughs> yeah, so I guess another quick introduction for me. Again, I'm Rick Rivard, AMSU's Vice President of Finance and Operations. What that really means is I oversee the contracts for different businesses, kind of our financial plans now and going into the future. Where this really ties into sustainability is the thoughts that I'm able to implement around our businesses and possible changes towards those to make it more sustainable in practice and also have just a more guided vision on a sustainable future for AMSU. Right. Thank you, Brooke. Okay, so the four primary areas when it comes to AMSU's sustainability mandate are split, as you can see there. Um, so they're split into operations, education and outreach, student events and activities, and advocacy priorities. So a bit of housekeeping, 
Brooke is going to obviously touch on the operations as the finance and operations vice president. I will touch on the education and outreach, student events and activities, and then Brooke will touch on um, our advoc advocacy priorities. But really, really quick, just before we get started with that, um, I thought we, it'd be nice to provide some background and context to where we were in 2020 and kind of how the presentation itself is going to work today. So the background to the mandate itself is that it was created by a previous executive at AMSU. And as I showed just earlier, it's split into those four parts, but um, AMSU has always been conscious of sustainability and it's always tried to promote sustainability around the university and in the province as well. And most typically that would occur with the decisions that we're able to make as an operation. So through our businesses, especially through degrees, so degrees provides fresh food on campus. This is a this is a subtle brag, I guess, a, a little bit of marketing, but uh, degrees is a leader when it comes to sustainability. So there's always been considerations around AMSU. And in 2020, all those, I guess, considerations and all the things that we do for sustainability was kind of put together in this mandate. And the plan was to split it through time. But of course, we've had to make changes and pivot, if you will, uh, with the changing situation with COVID and all those factors. But um, yeah, we'll get right into it with uh, operations. Yeah. So operations, there's a couple of things we're able to touch on here. The first and probably most exciting thing going on in UMSU right now in regard to sustainability is the development and changing of what UMCycle is, moving it from its current state of being a bike repair shop where it is a more sustainable business to something that can be more of a centralized hub for student sustainability across campus. Um, this role will see student leadership being brought on, an ability for more events to be put on through this space and a space for student di different student sustainability clubs and organizations to come together, get some resources that need it, if they need it, get access to volunteers, and just be able to implement more and more sustainable choices and uh, thoughts around campus. This area will also act as a bit of a mental library for all things sustainability for UMSU and on campus. As things currently work, even with the 2020 mandate around sustainability, uh, sustainability does still really fall into a kind of passion project for the executives. We're, we're very lucky this year to have two people actually kind of engaged in the space and interested in it, but there is currently the possibility where should a new team come in and none of them really care that deeply for sustainability, um, so we kind of lose sight of its sustainable vision. So the implementation of this student sustainability hub is how we hope to address that, make sure that sustainability stays first and foremost on the minds of the UMSU members and it just helps to make a more sustainable campus as time goes on. So emissions inventory is something we strive to do, just try and keep track of what's going on with our emissions. Obviously this year it's been a little weird with COVID, um, kind of hard to track the very sparse little trips in between going to the office and coming back. You think it's a little easier just with how few, but kind of hard to know when and where people are going. But that being said, it's nice to be able to say that our emissions have certainly been lower the past two years uh, because of the work from home policy, just no one really needing to do transit, but we have been trying to look into our electrical uses and what that will also mean for our emissions. So just to touch on some of the things that our businesses are kind of known for, Degrees was first and maintains being one of the few restaurants in Manitoba to have a LEAF certification. Um, if you're unfamiliar, this is just something that is kind of like the creme de la creme of sustainability for restaurants. Uh, it involves practices on sustainable food sourcing, uh, lower water usages, energy usages, uh, composting, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're looking at trying to get the hub into the same certification and also expanding that certification across all businesses as we aim for a more 
sustainable future for UMSU's businesses. Um, yeah, so some of those things that can help with that are on the next slide around ethical purchasing. Um, so in our businesses, we try as best we can to implement ethical pur purchasing. Uh, this past year, it's been a little difficult with COVID just to kind of balance out the finances of going for the more ethical choices, but with that increased cost and lower student engagement on campus, a little difficult to find that balance, but going forward into the new year, we're fully dedicated to having much more locally sourced food, uh, re-upping and expanding our use of recyclable materials, reusable materials. Right now in the office, we strive and just about fully use recycled products. Um, our paper, our stationery, just about all of that is recyclable or more so reusable wherever possible. Um, Moving on to some of the other things that UMSU can do for sustainability is noting our financial positions. Um, UMSU does sit on a wealth of money from students who have paid into it, and it's our responsibility to ensure that this money doesn't just sit in an area where, yeah, it's accruing some money, but it's accruing money for the wrong reasons. So in doing that, the Board of Trustees, we've passed a motion to divest from fossil fuels and weapons manufacturing, just something where it can be a bit more ethical in how UMSU is actually kind of maintaining its capital, moving more into green practices, solar, different farming, things like that. Uh, this is all handled under the Board of Trustees and specifically the Endowment Funds Investment Manager, but it has been making some notable strides in recent history and hopefully soon enough will be just about fully phased out of anything involving uh, petrochemicals, weapon art manufacturings, and we're able to have a fully sustainable investment portfolio. Um, some other ways that we're addressing sustainability in the businesses is we're trying to get rid of single-use plastics, single-use uh, packagings. So degrees, we use a lot of biodegradable single-use items, a um, couple wooden items, as the like, just to do our best to cut down wherever possible, just bits of waste that aren't exactly dealt with perfectly on campus. Um, we do have a composting program a little bit through degrees and we're expanding that through the other restaurants on the third floor this coming year, just to ensure that where we can, we are composting, and we're doing our best to limit waste management. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of bringing in more so reusable containers at the degrees, something where students would be able to grab it, take it away, and then bring it back on their next visit. Uh, there's just some hiccups there with trying to ensure how do the takeaway containers actually make their way back? How do we ensure that they're properly cleaned? And how do we actually do the on the ground work of handing it out, collecting it back? But those are issues that we are very eager to tackle hopefully get that up and going for this coming year when students are back, just really utilize this kind of gap in student engagement to act as a reboot for all of our businesses in many ways. I'll pass it on to Tino for education and outreach now. All right, thank you so much, Brooke. And yeah, that was a nice, overview on what the specific items under operations in the mandate are and uh, moving on to education and outreach. So one of the, I guess, influencing factors to the work that we do when it comes to sustainability is recognizing the most effective things that we can do as AMSU and where our decisions or our actions can be the most effective. And it's with education and outreach that we feel that we can have the most impact because AMSU does have a few platforms and we do have a strong student following. And we also have the capability to talk to every student. And as I'm sure a lot of people on the call know, uh, one of the most important things with sustainability is full context consideration and adoption of, I guess, cyclical systems and all that stuff. That's been some of the philosophy that's influenced us but yeah so with education and outreach some of these um, steps and all that it's 
guided or it's trying to push that idea of uh, spreading the message as one of the most effective things that AMSU can do. Okay, so coming up first with that is the AMSU Green Team. So the Green Team was part of the mandate um, that was passed in 2020. And as Jesse mentioned, I've had the pleasure of being the chair of the Green Team. And Brooke touched a little bit about on touched a little bit on student engagement and how that's been, you know, waning over the years just because there's been a lot of things happening. And I myself have felt it as well that I get quite tired of screens. So I can totally understand um, just wanting to maintain that screen time for work and then school and not wanting to engage with too much else after that. But I have taken the opportunity to engage a few students on creating a space where we have it as the kind of primary sustainability group at AMSU. Um, what we wish to do in the future is take the green team and incorporate it into a sustainability hub, like Brooke mentioned, that will kind of serve as the central area of um, sustainability at AMSU. And very much so at AMSU, a lot of the projects that work are working because of the passions and motivations of the executives. And we found that it was very important that, that, that the sustainability work isn't just being done out of passion, but I was happy to uh, sort of serve as the chair of the green team and see how we could have taken advantage of some of the opportunities there. Being a marketing VP myself, what I decided to do with this was take it and turn it into a brand of sorts and um, kind of have things that influence the brand itself. And I'm very excited to see where this will go in the future. And um, yeah, I think we've done fairly decently so far. So it's been good. Okay, so compost program expansion, right? So compost program, it falls under education and outreach because it's a very active thing, I suppose, when it comes to composting, because there needs to be consideration of waste management and separation of waste and knowledge and active participation by community members. Um, Degrees was the sort of flagship restaurant that we had with composting on campus. Degrees actually still composts their uh, waste, I believe. Brooke can give a nod if that's the case. Um, and I understand that we're looking to expand the composting program. We currently do it through a third party, but we're looking to expand it to all our businesses. And we are also currently advocating for a centralized system across campus because we believe that that's the best way to address all the waste that is generated on campus. And also it presents yet another opportunity to engage community members on uh, proper waste management and considerations when it comes to, first of all, reducing waste, but then also making sure that there is infrastructure in place that can be used effectively because um, there's been research, I think, done, uh, well, by researchers, but also internally at the university that shows that some of the pilot programs around campus do struggle a little bit with contamination and those other uh, concerns. So hopefully if there's a centralized system across campus, then there can be more knowledge uh, across the community. Okay, waste management, waste management advertising. So the goal here is pretty straightforward and simple. We want to add to the education by having signage around uh, the trash cans and all that stuff so that people understand what can go into recycling, what can go into composting and what is biodegradable and all those very nice things. I should also mention at this point that some of the slides here, because there were all points underneath uh, sort of the mandate. So this was a point underneath education and outreach. Some of them you'll find are sparse just because we haven't had much of an opportunity to work on some of these things. So the idea here is that there would be signage in our businesses. And unfortunately, our businesses haven't been open this whole time. So we're still kind of waking up. And um, so some of the items will kind of be like this. All right. So the amsu.ca sustainability webpage, this is something that very nicely falls under my portfolio. However, Admittedly, it's not something that I've worked on really over the past two years, but I'm glad to say that the page does exist and it doesn't have information on sustainability on campus. It's a little screen grab of it there. Uh, you feel free to check it out. Highly encourage you to do so because the info does um, is relevant, but it just hasn't been updated in a little bit. 
social media content. Okay, so you will recall that the green team has been turned into a bit of a brand. So that's what um, has turned, that's what we've done with it. Um, we saw that a lot of people are quite engaged on Instagram, especially over the past two years. So we decided to start with that space and, um, you know, humble shout out, I guess, on Green Team Amsu. Please follow it. It's got uh, information on the different events that we've done in the past when it comes to sustainability. It's got um, information on student groups at um, Amsu that are related to sustainability as well. So it's good stuff there. And then I will continue as well with student events and activities. I'm also just keeping an eye on the time there because I know that our time is finite. So moving along, the green events guide. So this is one of those items that we're very happy to uh, adopt within AMSU. So the green events guide was established by the Office of Sustainability. And the idea is basically that event organizers and event planners will have an opportunity to go through kind of a checklist of considerations that they sh should have considered or may want to consider if they want to make their event more green. And um, so at AMSU, um, so we want to do our part to make sure that student groups are actively taking this up as a framework to consider how they do their events. And I put there when I put the, the little certificate that we got for the keynote we did with David Suzuki. So it is a really good framework. And we are hoping that this is something that is adopted again across campus because it doesn't just have, I guess, environmental considerations. It also uh, goes into accessibility considerations as well. So again, it's, it's very nice to see that full context consideration as well. So yeah. Green events incentive. So this is something I touched on with the sustainability hub. I think it's kind of worked out really well because we have Mr. Money with us as well. So Brooke has been wanting to um, make sure that there's a budget line that acts as an incentive for students to use the green events guide. And this will be kind of tied into the sustainability hub that we're developing. All right, okay, if I say sustainability hub one more time. Uh, so this point is, is related to bringing together student groups that um, kind of act in the sustainability space. We've had an opportunity to meet and talk to student groups over the months and kind of sit down and do little, um, I guess, information gathering sessions. But one thing that we have found is that a lot of these groups are doing really, really great work, but by them, kind of by themselves. So the idea is to bring everybody together and realize where we have shared goals and shared ideals and take advantage of those opportunities. Okay, passing it back to Brooke on advocacy priorities. All right, so Amsu, um, big thing we do is advocate. So jumping right into it, um, when the Amsu um, sustainability mandate was first created in 2020, there wasn't something quite like what we have now with the climate action plan. Um, so climate action plan, I'm sure everyone here is super engaged and knows clearly about it. It basically has the detailings of um, uh, the university's plan to commit to net zero by 2050. Uh, over the past two years, UMSU has kind of been involved in uh, meetings regarding the feasibility of the plan, different aspects of the plan, and the ability to provide a bit of a student perspective on everything contained within it. We're really glad to see that it is shaping up and it's set to finish up and be good to go very soon here. Um, yeah, so next thing for you guys, because I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about CAP, heard about it so much because it is so big and wonderful. Landfill gas on campus, this is one of the possible things within it and something that UMSU has kind of also been looking at the past little bit. Um, unfortunately, we, currently don't really view it as super feasible just with kind of understanding the private interests and monetary uh, aspect of it between the city, the Brady landfill and the university cost may not be there quite yet, but we do really love the idea and the initiative to go forward with alternative forms of energy use on campus, just kind of any way we can stray away from normal petrochemicals is always super nice for us. Um, other ways that the sustainability mandate brought up advocacy was through the endorsement of UNDRIP and TRC calls to action. 
if you're unfamiliar, TRC is Truth and Reconciliation, and UN DRIP is United Nations, um, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Of course, being on a campus on unceded lands, we want to, as the union, really push forward a mandate that recognizes all the peoples and all the practices of the lands. So this is something that we really want to see pass through the board, just to have a more clear understanding and mandate going forward with how we can be sustainable and also more clearly involve different aspects and kind of viewpoints on sustainability. Um, the last thing for advocacy for you guys here is that on third party contracts. So one of the largest third party contracts on campus is Airmark Food Services, uh, recently renewed. They're the ones who supply Campo, they supply the uh, Fresh Food Company, all the places around campus just about. Um, so as a student's union, we are dedicated to uh, offering the student perspective on these contracts being able to consult with what's going on in the sustainability issues and seeing just kind of what practices are really being implemented within these contracts to ensure that sustainability is actually being noted and worked on. Uh, so this is something that we as a union have and will continue to be quite active on advocacy for. And yeah, so that pretty much wraps up the four primary areas, that being operation, education, outreach, student events and activities, and then of course, advocacy. Uh, if there's anything else that you guys feel should be a pillar, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, going forward, there's just a couple thoughts around how we can be moving forward with this mandate and also just general sustainability within the union. Uh, the first is reopening our businesses with sustainability in mind making sure that wherever we can be, we are implementing sustainable practices, connecting more with student groups through the UMSU Sustainability Hub. So this is moving more beyond just the small little group engagements that we've had on the CAP or different uh, sustainable documents throughout the year and moving more to a centralized thought, hosting more sustainable events through the Sustainability Hub, making sustainability more of a present thing on campus. Currently, we have sustainability season this month, but we'd love to see it move not just from being a month of advocacy to being throughout the year and always being a bit on people's minds. And then, of course, maintaining our advocacy priorities to ensure that we're able to advocate for the needs of students, advocate for sustainable practices on campus, and hopefully expand that, extend that past campus and moving more into Winnipeg and the greater Manitoba area. Thank you so much, Brooke and Tino. Uh, sorry to interrupt. We have just two minutes left. Uh, so I'm just going to pose a couple of quick questions here. Um, the first question asks about the outreach programs that you've mentioned in your presentation. Are all of those uh, in progress right now or are they kind of to come? And can you speak to uh, whether those are active right now? Yeah. So I can speak to the AMSU Green team because yes, it is active right now. Um, the, I guess the work that we've been doing has been primarily related to over this past year, specifically um, familiarizing ourselves with the U of M context when it comes to sustainability. There is on our website, amsu.ca, a form stack. If uh, you're a student or if you're a community member and you're interested in being involved with that, you can fill out the form and it will come to me. And um, we typically have meetings. We kind of call them whenever people are available. So, uh, you know, that's what that is there. But for the sustainability hub specifically, that's something that is going to be com coming. That's great to hear. Um, all right, one more here, and it sounds like you've partially answered this already, just relating to the green team and whether you plan to do some collaborative work or uh, consultations with other student councils such as SESES or EGSA. Um, it sounds like that's kind of a plan and just wondering about timeline on that. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that we've been that want, that we've been able to do is talk to groups in engineering and it was specifically student clubs 
don't think it was it was in the faculty of environment so yes the plan is to bring those students together and one idea that's been kind of ruminating in in our heads i guess is kind of an annual general sustainability meeting where we can bring together all students and um, get an understanding of the state of sustainability on campus and this would mean incorporating some of the things that we've talked about food contracts um the climate action plan and the steps involved in that so that's something that you can expect i guess communications on hopefully in the summer but definitely going into the full term knocking on wood that sounds great something to look forward to it's been so nice to hear these updates from umsu i know you're both so passionate about sustainability and climate action so thank you so much for joining us today there are a couple more questions in the Q&A box so um, that we don't quite have time for today, but Tino and Brooke, would you mind just typing those uh, responses into the, the Q&A box if you can? Absolutely, and thank you for having us and thank you for uh, taking in our presentation. Thanks again. And I believe I'll be passing in things over to Christy. Yes, thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Tino and Brooke. Uh, as always, we appreciate working with AMSU, and we look forward to all the, the good projects that they have coming up. Um, we're really excited to be working with you guys yet again. Um, so I'd just like to encourage everybody to stand up and shake it out a little bit. We're at about the halfway point of the day, um, and it is a lot of sitting. Um, so yeah, just stand up for a second. Uh, we have a little interlude here. Um, where I'm just going to um, share my screen. We have a sustainability literacy survey um, that is available for students uh, and the campus community to take at the moment. Um, I feel like I'm probably sharing the wrong screen, but you get the idea. Um, so you can see the survey at, or it's on our website right now at umanitoba.ca slash sustainability under the sustainability day page. And this survey, uh, it feeds into our sustainability tracking and rating system uh, report that we have coming up uh, in the next month or two. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at the general culture and literacy regarding sustainability at University of Manitoba. Um, so we're looking for those responses um, prior to March 14th. Um, so we'll just pop a link to the survey in the chat box and you can uh, take the survey when you have a free, free minute. Uh, so just stop sharing for a second. Um, so next up, this is the exciting part of the day. We're going to be doing some fair trade trivia with uh, the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation. So get your phones ready because this trivia is going to get wild. Um, please join me in welcoming Callan McDonald. Callan McDonald is the sustainability specialist with the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation. He is an alumni of the University of Manitoba with degrees in psychology and environmental studies. His work focuses on advancing the sustainable development goals and promoting fair trade at MCIC. Today, he will be leading in the fair trade trivia game. Welcome, Callan. Hey, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, as Christy said, my name is Callan McDonald, and I am the sustainability specialist with MCIC. Uh, super grateful to be here today. Uh, so a big thank you to the Office of Sustainability and the speakers who have come before me. Um, really excited for this afternoon as well. Uh, so yeah, as Christy was saying, we're a couple hours into the day now and you might need a little engagement. So I am here to lead you in an interactive activity, which is uh, fair trade trivia. Um, so we're going to be using a website called ahaslides.com, which you can see up on the slide here. Um, so I'd suggest opening that up on whatever device you wish to play with. Um, and you're gonna have the opportunity to win a fair trade prize. So we have fair trade canvas bag, and we got a fair trade handbook inside and some other, some other swag. So make sure you're paying attention. Um, so first I'll just give you a brief intro on what MCIC does and how we're connected to fair trade. So if you are unfamiliar with, with us, uh, we are the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation. We are a coalition of 44 organizations involved in international cooperation and development. Uh, 
Um, so we develop tools and provide resources to help Manitoba schools and educators contribute to international development, the sustainable development goals, and fair trade. So uh, we facilitate public engagement events and develop campaigns to encourage Manitobans to be active global citizens. Um, we are also responsible for distributing government of Manitoba funds designated for international development and humanitarian projects. Um, so what, what is fair trade? <laughs> the unfortunate reality right now is that many of the producers and farmers who grow the products we consume in our daily lives receive very little for their efforts. Low costs often outweigh compensation, environmental regulations, and proper working conditions for farmers. Fair trade is really a business model that is looking to solve this crisis by helping producers in the global south achieve better and more equitable trading conditions. Fair trade looks to balance concerns for people, the planet, and profit. Fair trade businesses are able to develop long term trading relationships with producer groups. A fair price for products is negotiated with a minimum guaranteed price. This price covers the cost of production plus a return, which protects producers from volatile market prices. Uh, you'll see some stats on the slide about countries and who is uh, involved in the fair trade system. Um, so what are some other good reasons to support? Um, producers, workers, and artisans receive fair pay. There is gender equality within democratic cooperatives. Conditions of work are fair and work environments are safe. No child labor. Strict rules are set to reduce environmental harm. And community, communities benefit from something called the fair trade premium. So a portion of profits is dedicated to education, healthcare, and other community initiatives. So training or capacity development, um, yeah, it's really, it's really a wonderful thing. Uh, so one of these benefits that goes to producers is tools and resources to build community climate resilience. The climate crisis disproportionately impacts smallholder producers in the global south, and in particular women, um, even though they are among the lowest generators of emissions. Fair trade supports farmers and workers to adapt to the changing climate and is helping to mitigate other major environmental problems. Uh, so really quickly, I did want to make one distinction, as you will see a lot in this trivia, fair trade will either be one word or two words. So fair trade, two words, is the system or the model. So that's the business model. Um, fair trade, one word, is the certification. So that's a product certification from Fair Trade International. Um, and here, yeah, I just want to show you like a list of some uh, products that are fair trade, and this is not an exhaustive list at all. There's actually thousands of products, uh, different products available in Canada alone. So um, this is just a few. I think a lot of times people think coffee is really the main fair trade item, coffee or chocolate. So it's actually a tons and tons of different things. Um, and then, yeah, I just want to do a brief snapshot on what fair trade looks like from a local landscape. Um, so we are seeing a bit of an increase in uh, fair trade products. So places like a &W, they're doing a big uh, campaign in terms of their fair trade coffee lately. Um, places like the convention center, major grocery store chains, liquor marts, but tons of other places. You just kind of got to look around for a little bit. And then we also have plenty of uh, certified uh, Manitoba institutions who are fair trade certified. So four towns, four schools, 20 workplaces, one campus, five faith groups. So there's a lot. Those might be a little different due to COVID. The certification was a little challenging the last couple of years, but um, yeah, so we're, we're actually, it's quite prevalent on a local scale. Okay, and with that, we are going to get to trivia. So um, yeah, so as we said at the beginning, you can go to ahaslides.com and there's gonna be a code that it's gonna ask you to enter. So the code is UMSD1, and then you can click join, and it should allow you to enter your name in just a moment. So we'll let people get going there. Looks like some people are starting to join. So yeah, the questions will appear on your computer screen and you'll enter your answers on your phone. Yeah, or computer screen, whatever device you're uh, using. And there are gonna be 15 multiple choice questions and you'll have about 30 seconds to respond to each. And the quicker you respond, the more points you will win. So at the end, whoever is in the lead will win our fair trade prize. Um, so I'll ask you to, if you win, I'll ask you to connect with us on our social channels, uh, MCIC on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or um, 
we could also, or you could also in, email info at mcic.ca. All right, we've got, still got some people joining. Um, while everyone's coming in, I will let you know about one of our events coming up. So we're actually doing a documentary screening at the Park Theater, which is happening on March 22nd, and it's in recognition of World Water Day. Uh, we will be screening There's Something in the Water, a film about communities in Nova Scotia who are plagued by the toxic fallout of industrial development. So if you're interested in joining us for that, um, yeah, we'd encourage you to come on Tuesday, March 22nd for World Water Day. All right, we're just about to get going. A few more people joining. I wish everyone luck and hope you were listening because there were some hints along the way. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's maybe get going. Okay, so we missed the first question, but we're gonna go on to question two. So which of the following is not a principle of fair trade? Is it A, building stronger relationships between producers, consumers, and business? Uh, B, creating higher profit for all players across fair trade supply chain? C, supporting producer organizations to improve their access to markets, tools, and resources? Or D, ensuring proper standards for working conditions, environmental standards, and respect for culture? All right, we got a smart crew. Most people choosing B, the correct answer. Okay, so question three. The fair trade premium is an additional sum of money that fair trade producer communities receive. What does this money go towards? Is it A, facilities and infrastructure? B, training and capacity building of producer organization staff? C, health and education services for communities, or D, all of the above. So five more seconds to answer. Great job, <laughs> everybody got that one right. All right, we got a close game already. Question number four, Fair Trade Month, brings together business partners, retailers, and campaigners to raise awareness about the fair trade movement. What month does this happen in? Is it A, May, B, July, C, September, or D, October? Three more questions, or three more seconds, sorry. Yes, May, A. So a lot of you said October, and I believe Fair Trade Campus Month is in October. Fair Trade Month is in May. So I can see why that would be a little tricky. All right, Kale in the lead. Number five. So which of the following is not a widespread fair trade item? Is it A, coffee, B, wine, C, potatoes, or D, bananas. So I can say that all of these are fair trade items. However, one is a little less common than the other three. Correct answer is C, fair trade potatoes. A lot of you said wine, and actually we do have wine available in the liquor marts. They do a really great job of, uh, of making sure there's always a fair trade wine selection available. Number six. So did you know that sports balls can be fair trade? In uh, which country are 70% of the world's hand-stitched soccer balls made? Is it A, Indonesia? B, Ghana, C, Senegal, or D, Pakistan. I will say that uh, Selkirk is a fair trade town and they actually sell Selkirk fair trade soccer balls if you're ever looking for one. 
Correct answer is D, Pakistan. That was a tough one, kind of answers all over the place. Okay, so question number seven. Only 13% of the world's cotton is produced sustainably. What is not true of cotton production? A, the environmental and social footprint of fair trade cotton is five times lower than conventional cotton farming. B, cotton production requires the extensive use of agrochemicals. C, India is the highest producer of fair trade cotton. Or D, fair trade standards ban genetically modified cotton seeds. Correct answer is B, yes. Cotton production does not need to require the extensive use of agrochemicals as fair trade demonstrates. Okay, so question number eight. How does buying fair trade tackle climate change? A, farmers must meet environmental standards as part of their certification. B, investments in community climate resiliency through the fair trade premium. C, farmers are encouraged to minimize the use of energy, especially from non-renewable resources. Or D, all of the above. Couple seconds. D, all of the above. Most of you got that right. Great job. Okay, on to question nine. So products with the fair trade mark are sold in how many countries globally? Is it A, 60, B, 80, C, 100, or D, 120 or more? Five seconds remaining. All right, so the correct answer is D, over 120. So fair trade is available in a lot of the world. So it's great. Okay, question number 10. How many different fair trade products are available in Canada? Is it A, dozens of products? B, hundreds of products? C, thousands or D millions. So I mentioned this in my intro on the, the slide about the products. Hopefully you're listening. Yes, correct answer is C. Most of you getting that right. Okay, so on to question 11. Uh, what city was designated the 25th fair trade town in Canada and the 2000th in the world in September of 2017? Is it A, Mont Saint Hilaire, Quebec? B, Selkirk, Manitoba? C, Springfield, Saskatchewan? Or D, Winnipeg, Manitoba? Couple seconds. So it is Winnipeg. I, I think I kind of tricked you there when I was talking about Selkirk earlier. So split between Selkirk and Winnipeg, but that, that one was Winnipeg. All right. So yeah, we're gonna kind of focus on some local questions here. Um, so the city of Winnipeg does not have which of the following fair trade designated institutions? Is it A, faith groups, B, libraries, C, workplaces, or D, schools? 10 seconds for this. So we do have faith groups where most of the answers went. It's actually libraries. So technically, if a library was to be 
fair trade designated, they would count as a workplace. So we have schools, workplaces, and faith groups. All right, three more questions. So question number 13, what percentage of Manitobans live in a designated fair trade town? Is it A, 25%, B, 47%, C, 62%, or D, 99%? That's right, 62%, most of you getting that one. Okay, last couple questions now. So question number 14. So what campus in Manitoba is the only fair trade designated campus in the province? Is it A, U of M Bannatyne campus? B, RRC Polytech Notre Dame campus? C, the University of Winnipeg, or D, uh, CMU, or Canadian Mennonite University? Five seconds to answer. So it's A, it is U of M Bannatyne campus, which is awesome. Okay, and the last question. So at what business will you find fair trade products? A, Safeway, B, a w C, Mountain Equipment Co-op, or D, all of these and so many more. I hope this wasn't, this is an easy one. All of these and so many more. Again, I think I tripped, tricked a few of you talking about AW earlier, but uh, you can find fair trade products at all of those. All right, so congratulations to Sasha. So if you want to uh, DM us on any MCIC social media channels, uh, we can get you your prize, or uh, we could also, you could also email us at info at mcic.ca. Um, so yeah, congrats to everyone. and. Uh, Thank you so much. I hope we've inspired you a little bit to use fair trade and uh, and look out for it. Thanks so much, Helen. That was super fun. Uh, I have to say I did poorly. I did very poorly, um, but it was still a lot of fun. So I appreciate you coming and uh, breaking up the day with us. Um, if folks want to learn more about MCIC and the programs that you guys have going on, where should they go? Yeah, our website is uh, mcic.ca, so that's probably the best place to go. But if you ever, if you're wondering something specific, uh, you can always email me at sustainability at mcic.ca, which is hopefully easy to remember, just because it's Sustainability Day. <laughs> so, perfect. Uh, well, we don't have any actual questions that I can see in the chat box. Um, so I'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, again, we very much appreciate you being involved in Sustainability Day. Yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, take care. Uh, I am going to pass it off to Kale, uh, who will introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Christy, and thanks, Callan. I had a blast playing trivia. Um, I hope everyone else did. So next up is Dr. Stefan Flumacher-Lima. Uh, Dr. Flumacher-Lima received his PhD from the University of Munich, was a group leader and assistant director in a non-university research institute in Berlin, and served as a full-time professor of ecological impact reserve and ecotoxicology at the Te Technical in University of Berlin. Uh, from 2017 to 2020, he was a full-time professor of aquatic etoxicology in an urban environment at the University of Helsinki, where he runs a joint laboratory of applied ecotoxicology with the Korean Institute of Science and Technology. His research was supported by a federal and regional ministers of China, 
Brazil, South Africa, Australia, South Korea, Germany, and Finland. At the moment, he's working on low impact development systems using aquatic plants for sustainable water purification, while also being the Dean of the Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. Dr. Fumatra Lima, we are so happy to have you here today. I will pass over to you now. Thank you very much. And thanks for this opportunity to, to join you on this sustainability day. I will just share my slides um, and I hope you can all see them. So yeah, I would like to, to take this opportunity to show you a little bit what we are doing at the Riddell faculty in direction of sustainability. Um, so the title of this is Sustainability Research as the Clayton H. Riddell faculty. And then the, the subtitle, From Aquatic Plants to Bisons. Um, this is quite a, a, a lot um, to span. Uh, I don't know if it was read before, but I would just like to acknowledge the traditional territory acknowledgement, um, but I thought it was done before, uh, so we can go on that. I'm at the moment teaching a course, and this course is called Urban Sustainability 2.0, what applied ecotoxicology can do for that. And one exercise I did with my great students there was I asked them to give me five keywords for, from them. What is sustainability for them? And then we just generated this word cloud and you can see it. It uh, is just uh, yeah, sustainability, environmental protection, biodiversity, but also uh, yeah, things like ethics, abilities, depletion, respectfulness, resource sources. So, Sustainability is really, really a broad field, and that's good, and uh, I hope we can keep it like that. So when we look at our faculty, I think we are working a lot on this environmental sustainability. And when we look at the um, yeah, definition given by the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development, it, it reads like acting in a way that ensures future generations have the natural resources available to live in equal, if not better, way of life as current generations and on our nice blue planet, which you can see on that slide. Um, yeah, as I said, um, we are doing quite a lot um, from aquatic plants to bisons. And uh, I, I would, of course, like to show you a little bit what is in between and in between our wetlands, in between our mangroves, in between our resources and exploitation. In between is beer and barley, which makes me, I'm coming from Bavaria, of course, very happy to see that. Um, then land management and grassland birds and bison. So that's the, the span we have in my faculty. And yeah, I don't have the time really to go into detail in all of them, but I thought I will just give you a broad overview of these things. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, as you heard from my CV, I was working in a lot of different countries and I learned that ecological conditions, economic and social dif uh, systems, they differ a lot from country to country. And, and therefore, there is no single blueprint for how sustainability practices are to be carried out. It is a case by case, um, which we have to do for every country, even for every town, for every city uh, on that. And we have to keep that a little bit in mind. So let's start. One of my major units in the, in the faculty working on environmental sustainability is the Natural Resource Institute, NRI. And they are, for example, looking at the effects of grazing on birds' populations. So in the Banff National Park, there was a reintroduction of the bisons. And I learned it's really massive and huge animals. So how do they influence uh, these little grassland birds by walking around, roaming around, maybe disturbing nesting and uh, egg production. And uh, that's a very in, in interesting research done by Alex and Nicola in my, in my uh, faculty. Then we have very similar to that um, ideas around improving land management for grassland birds. So of course, they, they, we, need, we need more food. And for that, we need more food production and um, grassland is really maybe transferred into agricultural land, but what can we do to really give the birds a place there as well, which is safe, where they can nest, where they can live um, without being hunted by these um, yeah, uh, um, big machines um, getting the corn from the field. 
And this is uh, research by Sach and also again by Nicola Cooper. Then we have um, what, as I already told you, me as a Bavarian makes me very happy. My family had a microbrewery in Bavaria and we were taking the barley from uh, the agricultural fields next to our village to keep really the, the transportation very short. But for that, of course, the, the barley has to have a certain quality. And I, when I was coming here from, uh, from Europe to be the Dean here, I saw this, uh, uh, a project by Ian Davidson Hunt and his colleagues looking at possibilities of a circular craft beer economy in Manitoba. So the same like we did in Bavaria, looking where we can get the barley here from local farmers to have short transportation, but to have a good quality for the beer to be produced. Um, the next one would be critical place inquiries. Considering oil and gas extraction in Southwestern Manitoba, that's work by Maya Wheeler, uh, looking at, yeah, what does it mean when we just pull resources out of, uh, of our planet? And the second one very similar is assessing the impact of increased resource extraction related to shipping. So we are tackling both the land-based stuff and also the water-based things by, by shipping and um, these are done by uh, Simon and by John Sinclair. Yeah, um, protecting white mangroves in Granada, um, done again by Soya and by Nicola. And I don't know if you know it, but mangroves are really tough plants. Um, they, they live on the edge of land to, to oceans, to water, to salt water, but they can be four times sequestered carbon um, much better than, than the rainforest can do. So four times more carbon sequestration than a, than a rainforest. Um, this can be seen as an um, ecosystem service. And uh, of course we can transfer ecosystem services into money, into money value. And if we do this, then we are coming up with some um, values, which means that mangroves can uh, give us $194,000 per hectare on that ecosystem service. If we now look at the remaining um, mangrove forests and the, the, the space, the area they have, that will sum up with a huge sum of $2.7 trillion as an ecosystem service per year, what these mangroves forests are providing to us. If we would have these $2.7 trillion as a university budget that makes us all happy. So looking at that, what the mangroves can do for us, we have to see how to protect them. And a major threat for them is of course that, um, yeah, for example, plastic uh, coming in from the oceans to the shorelines, to the mangrove forests and getting stuck into these uh, aerial root system of these little trees and making major damage on that. So this is something which is tackled by Soya and Nicola and uh, it's an important research for all of us in that way. Um, another project, which is um, yeah, for the birds, but you can also see it's, it's in, in a way also related to us. We are all disturbed by noise, um, whether it's construction noise or noise on the street, noise in the city, um, noise from airplanes flying over our house or wherever we are. And uh, Nicola, uh, with her team is determining uh, the effects of anthropogenic noise on songbirds. Um, yeah, not all the birds have these nice headsets on, so they will be destroyed by these, um, they, they will be um, yeah, affected by this anthropogenic noise. And what happens? Are these songs from these birds getting louder to compete with these anthropogenic noise? Or is it getting more, or, or does it really disappear? That do, do it, uh, are they not singing anymore? Do we expect a second silent spring like um, we, we already saw with uh, Rachel Carson and her book, which is by the way, very nice to read and you should, should do that as well. Um, then we have in our other department, environment and geography, we are tackling the question of enhancing Arctic wastewater treatment through natural wetlands. You all know that we can use wetlands for water treatment to remove contaminants 
um, on that. And uh, we have uh, several projects. One of them by Mark Hansen is on the Baker Lake. And uh, they try with building up a wetland there to see how they can in these yeah, harsh climate, what we have, uh, and if I look outside of my window, there's um, nearly middle of March and we still have nearly a meter of snow here. And this morning it was minus 23 degrees. So that's for plants, really hard conditions. And um, yeah, we have to see how we can use plants for wastewater treatment also in this kind of a, of a climate. Um, this fits in into my own research, what's, what I'm doing and what already mentioned as uh, low impact development systems. We are just trying to develop wetlands even more and even further, um, building up sustainable water purification using systems, what I call the green liver and plant gill systems. So in the direction of green biotechnology, we use plants and plants have pretty much similar, the same enzyme setup uh, for detoxication, for biotransformation, like we have in our own liver. So what we can detoxify, plants can do pretty much the same. And uh, for that, I was calling these things then green liver system. So I'm using plants in a complete artificial setup to clean water. And also we develop systems and you all know microplastic and plastic is a big threat to our environment. You also develop filter systems using um, plant waste products like uh, coconut shells um, to filter out microplastic from water bodies, from stormwater, that it's not reaching the environment. That's what I call um, the environmental sustainability solar system of my faculty. So everything is turning around this topic, environmental sustainability, sometimes more close, sometimes a little bit more far away, but building up this solar system and trying to enhance our knowledge on environmental sustainability. And I hope that with the years coming, we, we can see more little planets circling around this uh, environmental sustainability. And then also contributing to what is done here at the University uh, of Manitoba in that direction. We have also sustainability-based lectures at our faculty. Um, there's sustainable Manitoba or sustainable water management, sustainable development and natural resources, sustainable economics and natural resources, and the urban sustainability 2.0. So that's where we tackle really questions around sustainability from different points of views. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a good setup. And also here, I hope, to see it growing around this topic more and more that we can offer students um, more information on sustainability and what to do and how to do it. Um, we are not alone in the world. So I'm coming from uh, yeah the last three years, I was professor in Finland at the University of Helsinki. And uh, during that time, we set up there a Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science, which is uh, HELSOS. I'm still a member of HELSOS, and with that, we have a great link to Europe and what's going on on sustainable uh, science issues between these two universities, Manitoba and Helsinki. And uh, yeah, we have to see how we can, in the near future, enhance the cooperation between these two institutes uh, in favor of sustainability. With that, I thank you very much for that. And I'm open for a question and will stop sharing my slides. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Pumacho Lima. It was such a nice overview of all of the work that's being done in the faculty. Um, so just a reminder to everyone out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. But uh, while we're waiting for those, I do have one that I wrote down for myself. Uh, so you talked about all the work that's being done. And um, I'm wondering, looking at the university as a whole, is there anything that you wish could be added in the future to that solar system that you shared? So is there any piece of research that you really hope to see at the U of M that you think would be a good fit? Yeah, I think, you know, um, the, the topic of sustainability should be in our all the time in our flesh, in our mind. Um, so um, I really hope that when this new strategic plan of the UM is developed, that sustainability is a big issue in that plan, and I will do my best to really put that into that. 
um, because that's that's important to be really on top of, of what we are doing. Um, I forgot to mention that we have students building up, uh, for example, a startup repairing bikes, which is which is very sustainable because the, the resources are old bikes. So these are things we would like to support and we would like to see more that we find space for these little startups uh, on campus that they can develop their things. Um, that's that's one of the, the uh, ideas we have. Um, we have a big idea, which is which I called a think tank building for the whole university for all faculties. Um, and in this kind of a new building, maybe there would be space for startups, there would be space for little shops from people, um, yeah, selling fair trade products, offering sustainability services, and on all these kind of things. I think we have a big playground and we should use it at this campus um, in the direction of sustainability. I really like that. And it, it kind of feels like it encapsulates some of the other themes that have been highlighted today, where it's community coming together, having that engagement with one another and seeing how each per person's skills can work together towards a main goal. So I think yeah. that's a really great idea. We, we would you. love to continue to support in the Office of Sustainability as well. Perfect. Um, so just looking and it looks like there's a couple questions. One here. Uh, with the breweries, would there be a possibility of starting a University of Manitoba microbrewery maintained by students uh, with the money going back towards students and student groups such as UMSA? Yeah, I think, you know, um, me as a Bavarian, I would completely support that, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think that's a, that's a cool ideas to do, absolutely. Um, it take my family uh, really 20, 25 years to really recognize that the barley around our little village has the same quality like we get it from elsewhere in Germany. Um, with that, we save a lot of transportation. We, we, uh, yeah, we help the environment and all these. And, and that would be a good idea, um, just having from agriculture a joint venture, having a small brewery here, uh, having maybe a small bakery here, uh, run by students and, and doing these things and showcase what's possible. And I think that's the main important thing, build showcases that others in the community around our university in Winnipeg can learn from that and can then do it in their own uh, little um, places where they are, whether it's uh, um, yeah, Charles Wood or where, wherever here in Manitoba. Um, so that's a good idea, definitely. Maybe there could be a beer tap in the think tank in that building. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so there's lots of comments just saying thank you so much and how interesting that was. Uh, and then a couple other comments coming in here. One is, um, how can students get involved and learn about upcoming research opportunities within the faculty? Um, with, with setting up our new website, we will, we will have a portal there um, where students can have a look at. The other possibility is come to us, ask, come here. The doors are open, um, the restrictions are losing. Um, in that way, we are coming back and we are bringing back our people to the, to the faculty building. So we are there for you. Come in, talk with us. My door is always open. So just, uh, yeah knock at the door, take a cup of coffee, and then we can sit down and see what, what we can do together. It's an important topic. And as more people are really working and thinking towards that, it will enhance our knowledge on sustainability. So I'm happy to do that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so there's another question, might be a little, a little bit of a loaded question, but uh, I do recognize that a lot of the instructors that you mentioned on that one side have a lot of autonomy, which I think is so lovely in their classes uh, and just in their practices. So one question that came in was, what are some of the ways faculty members are reducing their own environmental impact, whether that be potentially reducing flights, more engagement practices, how they're running their courses, things like that. Is there anything you could speak to? Yeah, um, I think that's one point what COVID really teached us that it's not necessarily for a 10 minutes talk to fly around the world. 
Um, and I have an eye on that and I talk with the people. If I see that someone is flying from, from here to, to New Zealand for a 10 minutes talk, I, I really talk with him uh, or with her and ask, is it necessary? Is there not a hybrid model where we can do that? Um, of course, we have people telling me, okay, but the, the personal connections and in-person and that's necessary. Yeah, that is, but maybe not with all the conferences. Yeah, maybe once a year, and then we do the rest uh, online um, and in person. Um, yeah, re let's reduce these flying around for only 10 minutes. And, and I think that's important. That's an important step. And I try to really implement that in the faculty by talking with the researchers. Some of them are, yeah, positive on that. And some of them said, no, I, I would like to go to New Zealand. That's it. But mm -hmm. this is how it is. Uh, but if we get maybe from five people, three of them rethinking their trip, that's a win. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I agree. Yeah, and one of the one of the things that we're looking at in the office too is maybe uh, looking at the distance that someone's traveling and if it if it warrants a plane or maybe it is a car or a train or something with less impact. And I think that the yeah. benefits are so wide there too, because then you can see the outside in your travels, which is such a lovely thing. You don't just see the clouds, which are beautiful, but you actually get to see the topography of Canada if you are traveling within a certain radius within Canada, which I think is is something very special as well. Yeah, definitely. Uni University of Helsinki was implementing that two years ago mm -hmm. um, before COVID arrives already. So that they were looking at the distance. Is it really necessary to take a plane or can we take a train? Mm -hmm. um, or do we have other means by, by traveling there? Um, so it's it's something which is, yeah, which we can look at. And of, of course, driving by a train through the Canadian prairie and landscape, for me, that would be fantastic um, uh, because I'm not from here. I like to see that. But um, yeah, sometimes, of course, it's much faster to go by plane and then we have to see. But again, it's a matter of discussing it mm -hmm. and talking about it. Yeah, ensuring that that dialogue is open. I couldn't agree yeah. more. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. We really appreciate the time that you took to be here. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. And it, thanks again for inviting me and for letting me talk a little bit about our sustainability. See you then. Bye-bye. Take care. Uh, okay, so at this time, I'm going to pass it back off to Christy. No, Jesse. Jesse, that's who I'm going to pass it off to. There you go, Jesse. Thanks, Kale. And thanks, Dr. Lima. Next up is a short video presentation from Ishan Samarana Nayak. Ishan received his Bachelor of Sciences in Biology from the University of Peridinia, Sri Lanka, and his Master of Sciences in Entomology and Landscape Ecology from the University of Manitoba. Currently, Ishan is a research technician in agronomy at the University of Manitoba's Plant Science Department. Ishan is conducting research and biodiversity surveys on urban natural areas in the city of Winnipeg and conservation projects in home gardens in Sri Lanka voluntarily. He is a member of the International Union for Conservation Nature, IUCN, which is the global authority on the status of the natural world and the measures needed to safeguard it. Also, Ishan is working with Scouts Canada and Sri Lanka Scouts Association for educating the young generations to promote, su promote, support, and strengthen nature conservation in climate change. So I will turn it over to our IT specialists here to start up um, this video. I am Ishan Samaranayak. Thank you very much for the sustainability of it for inviting me for giving a small talk about wildlife diversity at the Fort Carey campus, University of Manitoba, for our Sustainability Day 2022. Before starting the topic, let's learn about biodiversity. Biodiversity is a term used to describe the enormous variety of life on Earth. 
It can be used more specifically to refer to all of the species in one region or ecosystem. Biodiversity refers to every living thing, including plants, bacteria, animals, and humans. As you can see this slide, biodiversity is related to many things. There are three levels of diversity, such as genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. Genetic diversity. Every species on Earth is related to every other species through genetic corrections. The more closely related any two species are, the more genetic information they will share and the more similar they will appear. And organisms, cross relatives are members of its own species, organisms with which it has the potential to mate and produce offspring. Species diversity is the variety of species within habitat or a region. Species are the basic unit of biological classification and thus the normal measure of biological diversity. Species region is the term that describes the number of different species in a given area. The world total is estimated at 8.7 million species, though only 2.12 million have been named scientifically so far. Ecosystem diversity is the intricate network of different species present in local ecosystem and the dynamic interplay between them. An ecosystem consists of organisms from many different species living together in a region and their connections to the flow of energy, nutrients, and matter. Canada's biodiversity. Canada is home to a wide spectrum of significant biodiversity, including the vast portion of the world's boreal forest, 20% of its freshwater resources, and the longest coastline on the planet. Canada also has a part of global wetlands and 25% of remaining global temperate rainforests. These ecosystems are globally significant. They provide habitat for a unique variety of plants and animals, including many that are central to the traditions and cultures of indigenous peoples. There are 70 to 1,000 species described by science in Canada, while another estimated 69,000 species remain to be named and classified by scientists or recorded the first time. If viruses are included, the number of estimated species would be doubled. About 51% of Canada's species are terrestrial, 23% are freshwater, and 25% are marine. If you look at the higher groupings, like phyla, then 61% are on land, 72% in freshwater, and 84% in marine waters. Manitoba's biodiversity. Manitoba hosts five major life zones or biomes. Grasslands, boreal coniferous forests, arctic tundra, freshwater, and arctic marine biomes. Plus aspen parkland, eastern deciduous forests, and forest tundra transitions. Each of these major biological communities teams with countless number of diverse species. From huge whales, Landsman jellyfish and the seven meter Greenland shark in the Hudson Bay to bizarre amounts of tropic life forms in the soil, water, and air, and even in on our bodies. Manitoba is truly buzzing with life during all season, even under the snow and ice. There are 635 vertebrate animals, such as fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, and over 3 to 1,000 invertebrates like insects, spiders, worms, crabs, lobsters, squids, and clams in Manitoba. Also, there are around 200 plants, 800 lichens, 3,000 fungi, and a treasure in 36,000 elk in Manitoba. Certain of these figures will continue to rise with new studies. There are no numerical estimates for the other groups. 
such as protozoans, bacteria, or viruses. Let's go on to our topic. Do we have rich wildlife diversity at the Fort Garry campus? To know the answer, I have conducted the terrestrial vertebrate inventory at the Fort Garry campus since 2030. I have selected four main areas at the campus, such as a trail around the Red River, at the Pine Research Station, South Woodland Lands, lands beside the Markham Road. I have recorded the observation of amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, and used pictorial guides and web apps to identify them on random days as in my free time. In Manitoba, there are 16 amphibians. Among them, I observe only two frog species, such as northern level frog and wood frog, as shown on this slide. In Manitoba, we have eight reptiles, including five snakes, one lizard, and two turtles. In our campus, I found common guard snake, common snapping turtle, and western painted turtle, as shown in the slide. There are around 391 bird species in Manitoba. Among them, I observe only 48 species during my inventory. However, I am expecting there are more bird species in our campus land. I have recorded 15 mammal species during my study. For your interest, there are 88 mammal species in Manitoba. Now we have the answer for our question. Yes, we do have rich wildlife diversity at the Fort Garry campus. Also, I am expecting more terrestrial vertebrate species as well as more invertebrates finding our campus premises. So, we need your help to record these species. Students, staff, and faculty can join the citizen science project to identify flora and fauna on our campus. I would like to suggest using the inaturals.org website or its mobile app to record your observation here of our Fort Garry campus. The app is helpful for identifying species and confirming your species by three naturalists or suggesting the correct identification of the species that you uploaded. Now you can watch a short video clip about it. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturals app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit next if it looks good. To identify it, hit what did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation detail screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. time and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. Hope you enjoyed the talk and hope you see the amazing biodiversity in our Fort Garry campus. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ishan, for that informative video. Next up is one of our own, Kale Klostik. Kale is the project's coordinator in the Office of Sustainability and has been working at the University of Manitoba for almost three years. She has a demonstrated history of working in post-secondary institutions, working mainly on plans, policies, and engagement. Welcome, Kale. Thanks so much, Jesse. And hello, everyone. Oh, I did. Uh... 
Gotta share my screen first. Can everyone see that? Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, so my name is Kale, and I will be presenting today on the University of Manitoba's forthcoming climate action plan. This plan has been in the works for over a year now. It has not yet been approved, but we are hoping that it will be so in the next couple of weeks. So what is a climate action plan? The University of Manitoba's climate action plan lays out a clear pathway for the U of M to reach the determined commitments that I will discuss in a moment. It also is founded on the most effective approaches to decarbonize currently De to decarbonization that is currently available to us. And lastly, it is developed specifically to suit the University of Manitoba's local energy and emissions profile, its building constraints, and its cold weather climate, and other elements that make up the unique context and culture of our community. This climate action plan takes a look at where we are, are what we are already doing, and digs a little deeper to, to see what is left to do and what we can do better. Before I get started, I think it's really important to note that although I am presenting this plan, to get to this point and to achieve all that we have that I'll talk about going forward, it involves every person and every corner of the University of Manitoba at all of our campuses. So thank you to the community for the never ending insight and thank you all for being here today. So before we talk more about the climate action plan, let's talk a bit about how we got here. The University of Manitoba's sustainability strategy approved by the Board of Governors in 2019 outlines the university's commitment to significant large scale action. The document is the Office of Sustainability's guiding tool for what we do in our office on a day to day basis, and it consists of the three sections that you see on the screen infrastructure and operations campus life and research and academics. Within these three sections, there's a total of 14 goals and 64 commitments. One of the 14 goals is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the commitment that goes with that, as seen on the screen, is to create a climate action plan that includes targets for emission reductions, resilience and adaptation, and considers the financial benefits of planning. So from this, we know and we knew that we needed to take immediate action on climate change. From that understanding and the university support, the U of M signed the Global Universities and Colleges Climate Letter in 2020. It is now called the Race to Zero and it commits the university to three things. The first is mobilizing more resources for action-oriented climate change, research and skill creation, a pledge to reach net zero by 2030 or 2050 at the very latest, and increasing the delivery of environmental and sustainability education across curriculum, campus, and community outreach programs. The most time sensitive is that one in the middle, which is reaching net zero by 2050. So from this commitment, the university sought out a consultant that would be an expert in this line of work, which ultimately is bringing the emissions of a small town down to virtually zero. In the fall of 2020, we hired Sustainable Solutions Group, also known as SSG, based out of Victoria, BC. With Sustainable Solutions Group help, we collected a large portion of the UM's historical data, ranging from enrollment and employment sizes, building information, waste data, even parking stalls, and we gave it all to SSG. From this data, a baseline year of 2019 was picked. As seen on the right, the emissions for the baseline year totaled 57,000 tons of CO2 emissions, which, which if we could see it, would look like to a two-story high sphere. So breaking this down, it meant that 1.1% of or UM fleet, fleet vehicles were responsible for 1.1% of this total. Uh, livestock was responsible for 2.3%, waste at 3.8%, business travel at 6.7%, commuting at 21.4% and buildings at 64.6%. Considering this data and the commitment we made by signing the, the university climate letter, a University of Manitoba goal was established to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So 
So from the outset, we knew this needed to be a community plan. COVID posed many challenges to engagement, but we persevered and were able to hear from the public through six methods. The first was pre-engagement interviews with 12 individuals that we felt would have insight into how best to engage with the UM community. This engagement was for the purpose of this plan, but also how we continue to engage throughout the implementation of the plan. Another group was the Climate Action Plan Working Group, which consisted of nine members of the campus community. This group focused on the technical abilities of the university and what could be accomplished based on nuances specific to our location and resources available. Additionally, immensely valuable information was gathered from the Sustainability Committee in the creation of this document. And fourth, public lunch and learn sessions were hosted by the Office of Sustainability in May of 2021 that looked at five big move areas, which I'll talk a bit more in a couple slides about. And fifth, we also ran an online survey during that month of May for those that could not attend in-person or virtual sessions. On the right is a word cluster that was generated from the survey when respondents were asked what they would like to see if they were standing on a U of M campus in 2050. And last, using the outline of our lunch and learn sessions, we created a discussion toolkit that allowed groups within the university to host their own engagement sessions. This information was sent back, reviewed, and incorporated into the Climate Action Plan. So now that we know the goal of the Climate Action Plan and who was involved, let's talk about the boundary and the scope of the plan. So the emissions boundary of the Climate Action Plan includes the campuses and locations shown on the map on the right. This includes the responsibility of assets owned or under the operational control of the university, such as buildings, land, vehicles, and equipment. The scope of the Climate Action Plan is production-based, meaning it accounts for emissions produced within the boundary of the university's properties or as a direct result of the activities within those boundaries. It's broken down into three areas. The first is scope one emissions. These are emissions from within the geographic area and include things like furnaces from the Fort Erie District Energy System, university fleet vehicles, agricultural activities, and waste and water generated on campus. Scope two emissions are produced outside the U of M boundaries, but consumed by the university. This includes electricity from the provincial grid used for lighting, plug load, heating, and any other purpose at the university. This also includes building electricity and heat use at the Bannatyne campus that comes from the Health Sciences Center District Energy System and is not owned or controlled by the university. And then last is scope three, which is other indirect emissions not included in scope two. These emissions are a result of commuting to and from university locations, from business and research travel, and from the university's waste and wastewater facilities off campus. These emissions are a consequence of our university's activities, but occur at a source that the U of M does not own or control. What the plan does not cover is a consumption-based emissions inventory. And this is where responsibility is assigned for emissions to the community in which the production or service is consumed rather than the community in which it was produced. This type of inventory would calculate the emissions generated to produce and transport food to the U of M, which this inventory does not cover. So let's see what this looks like if we have to chart out all the information we have so far. In the graph on the left, the dotted yellow line shows the first step and reduction of a reduction of 50% by 2030. The blue line above shows the University of Manitoba's emissions from now until 2050 if no additional policies, actions, or strategies to address energy use and emissions are implemented other than those currently underway. In this scenario, U of M's total emissions will decrease by 20% by 2050. And remember, we want to get to 100% reduction. So how can we get to this, our pathway to net zero? And that's the lighter blue line that just appeared on the graph. Let's look at five big move areas to identify how we can make this happen. So the first is low carbon buildings. 
These actions focus on raising energy efficiency standards in new buildings to ensure they function at a net zero level and to retrofit old buildings to be more energy efficient. The overall result is a reduction in energy used in UM buildings. To give you a better idea, in 2019, buildings were responsible for 83% of the University of Manitoba's energy use and 65% of its annual emissions. Winnipeg's average annual temperature is expected to increase by approximately 2% due to climate change, two degrees due to climate change, sorry. And this means an approximate, approximately 16% less energy will be required to heat buildings, but way more energy, approximately 61% more energy will be required to cool buildings. So to ensure we meet the determined actions listed on the slide, we are in the process of finalizing a sustainable design guideline that will work in tandem with the Climate Action Plan to ensure that new buildings meet the necessary standard. Magizia Gamic, which is based at the Fort Gary campus, is on the right and a great example of a low carbon building. Incorporating things like natural vegetation, that native vegetation that doesn't require irrigation and provides uh, habitat for wildlife, natural lighting, and use of local materials can increase the efficiency of a building and reduce the embodied carbon within it. So the second area is energized renewability. These actions focus on replacing the energy currently used in buildings with renewable energy. In 2025, the existing Fort Erie district energy system will be supplemented by nine megawatts of electric boilers, which was that 20% emissions reduction we saw in the business as planned graph. This translates into a 41% reduction of our natural gas usage and will amount to a total of 13,000 tons of CO2 avoided each year. Remember, we're starting with 57,000 tons of CO2 each year. So out of the 59% of emissions remaining, transitioning our campus to landfill gas could reduce our natural gas usage by an additional 40%. Landfill gas is generated from waste at the Brady Road landfill and is currently being flared, but could be sent to the University of Manitoba. Another option will be to, would be to use a renewable natural gas facility, also known as an anaerobic digestion facility, to produce renewable natural gas using organic solid waste from Winnipeg. That would cover 40% emissions reduction. The remaining 20% natural gas usage reduction would come from building optimization that I spoke about in the previous slide. There was a comment in the chat earlier in the day that mentioned solar panels, and it is also mentioned on the slide. Through our extensive work with SSG, studies of other institutions with similar climates to ours, as well as discussions with experts in the field that took place, we considered everything that we found. And what we found, we did conclude that because our energy in the province is relatively clean due to hydroelectricity, the return on investment of solar panels would be long and perhaps would not yield the benefits they would elsewhere around the world. That being said, it was recognized that there would be a time and a place for solar panels on campus to reach the targeted 7.3 megawatts of capacity over 20 years. So the third area is moving forward. These actions represent several strategies to incentivize people to commute differently, to travel for research and business less, to switch to electric vehicles, and to work remotely when possible rather than commute to campus. Not all of these things we have direct control over, but we can influence actions strongly. For electric vehicles, we can improve parking infrastructure around campus to facilitate this change for the community. Currently, thanks to funding from the provincial government, we're adding 10 level one charging stations, six level two charging stations, and two fleet vehicle level charging stations to the Fort Gary campus to facilitate this transition. Other items in this section would include incorporating larger car-free zones, eliminating parking subsidies, and completing active transportation infrastructure to allow people to commute to campus in a more sustainable fashion. So the fourth section is wasting not. And this action is aimed at reducing the total amount of waste generated and increasing the diversion of waste from the landfill. This includes examining purchasing policies and how to limit the amount of waste that comes onto our campus. And it also includes educating users, the U of M community, on how they can make an impact and put their waste in the correct streams to increase diversion and reduce waste contamination. 
Some things that launched this year to facilitate that are the UM sort tool that you see on the screen, which is an easy to use tool that allows you to search for the name of a waste item and tells you exactly how to recycle or dispose of it. For example, if you're looking at where to put that pesky Tim Hortons cap, it goes into the landfill. Another thing that was launched is the UM waste sorting game, where you can put your knowledge to the test on proper waste disposal while designing your own digital park, a way to gamify your knowledge. And lastly, this area also includes launching a post-consumer organics collection program in hallways at all campuses of the University of Manitoba to help reduce the amount of methane being generated from organic waste in landfills. And the last section is the restoring and reconciling area. This action identifies opportunities to remove greenhouse gases from the air, increase biodiversity, and create more green spaces at the University of Manitoba by planting more trees. The intention of this big move area is to offset the impacts of the things that we do not have the ability to change now, such as greenhouse gases produced from livestock production. The takeaway from stakeholder engagement was that this is a challenge, but also very ingrained in our academia at this moment. And so in conclusion, how does the University of Manitoba's Climate Action Plan fit in with the Sustainable Development Goals? Well, we think that SDG goal number 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts is all about the climate crisis. And that's exactly what the Climate Action Plan is about. Keeping in mind that none of the SDGs are mutually exclusive and working towards one of them means working towards all of them. It should be recognized that the Climate Action Plan does some notable things. The first is, is that it consists of ambitious goals. There's no question about that. But they are goals that align with the International Panel on Climate Change, also known as the IPCC, recommended global emissions reductions targets. Achieving these targets and shifting to zero 100% emissions reduction globally would mean that global heating is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050, of which we are already currently at 1.2 degrees. Uh, climate change impacts will still occur during this time if the target is met, but we could avoid catastrophic events. The University of Manitoba's Climate Action Plan is the University of Manitoba's way to address the climate crisis and make a positive change right here at home. So what can you do? You can get involved. Please get involved by joining events, becoming a sustainability ambassador, and engaging with your peers to really have conversations about the climate crisis and what's happening and what actions you can take to help combat. Uh, also staying up to date, as you know, I work in the Office of Sustainability and we have endless resources that we share on our Instagram and our Twitter. I recommend signing up for our newsletter. We send it out about every three months or so and then following our Climate Action Page website so you know exactly what's happening with this project at any time. And there's a couple things that were already mentioned today too, but really think about your impact every day, but especially on days like World Water Day, Earth Day, and Earth Hour. Try participating in Bike Week and Commuter Challenge when the weather gets nicer, and be sure to bring your own reusables when you come back to campus, including your water bottle, cutlery, and a reusable bag for your bookstore. Try hosting a green event like this one today, whether it's in person or online, as Tino had highlighted earlier. And be sure to take advantage of things like Go Manitoba to find a carpool or a ride buddy for your commute, whether that be biking, busing, or driving. And then lastly, as Christy had mentioned earlier, we really wanna hear from you. Uh, so we know that the community needs, what the community needs are, and we understand what they need as far as education goes for climate, sustainability, and more. So I invite you to fill out the sustainability culture and literacy survey when you have time so we can evaluate our successes and areas in need of improvement for sustainability outreach and education initiatives. Thank you so much for having me. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Kale. That was a lot to cover, and I think you did a great job of summarizing a huge and exciting plan coming uh, to the university. We have a few questions just coming in now. Have you noticed or do you see any gaps that can be filled in the Climate Action Plan by the campus community as a whole to fulfill these? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think what I had mentioned at the beginning is that it will take the whole campus community to have this plan succeed. So I think some actions would be to really understand and if there is something in the in the campus or sorry in the climate action plan that you don't understand, uh, how can the Office of Sustainability help to make that more transparent or more digestible so you understand the full scope and what um, and what role you can play, whether that be individual in your classroom at home or at a larger scale of activism. Great suggestions. Any thoughts for. Um how classes can take this climate action plan and really break it down as a class or for students or some different you know, student project ideas that could come from this? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, I think really kind of coming off of the conversation that uh, Stefan Flumacher Lima had mentioned and, and just trying to incorporate it into classrooms, whether that be a discussion on a topic, a discussion on the climate action plan, um, how the climate action plan is being communicated or just getting in touch with nature itself and getting outside and understanding the importance of it, which is really nature and why we want to protect, protect the world that we live in and the benefits of being outside and being with each other and that community that's created around the actions that we take. So I think that would be um, a really fun activity for students to just open up the dialogue and talk about it a bit more and get in touch with certain aspects of the plan. Great suggestions. And from the staff and faculty side, do you have any thoughts on how staff members and faculty members can get involved in the plan? Yeah, I think that um, I think that there's a lot of processes at the university that have been the way that they have been for a really long time. And I think that just like students, faculty and staff have um, a firsthand view and experience as to how these things are maybe not as sustainable as they could be. So as we were talking about, potentially thinking about if you have to travel for work, how far are you going? And really try and take that step to mitigate your impact as best as you can through the actions that you can control. So if you can attend something virtually, try attending something virtually. Um, you know, when you say, how can students get involved? Maybe it's a group bike ride to campus. And maybe that means that the instructor joins in. And so maybe there is that interconnecting between faculty and staff and students to all reach that common goal. Great suggestions. A few more questions coming in. Um, why do you think that environmental issues sometimes don't get the same resource mobilization um, as other issues that come, come along on campus? These are good questions. <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think that it always feels like it's potentially a moving target because things in sustainability or the environment are always changing. Uh, so what is the temperature that we really want to stay below, you know, and, and what does that mean for our geographical location as well. Uh, and then on that note, how do, do we actually see that where we are and is it tangible and often it's not, you know, when we see we had 30 plus days above 30 plus degrees in Winnipeg. That was nice because we also have been under 150 centimeters plus of snow, right? But we have to remember what that means and what how our climate is changing around us. So I feel like some of the some of the causes of climate change are very fleeting, and we don't connect them exactly to what the cause is and how we could make an impact. Um, and I think that's really hard to attach a dollar amount to sometimes because you don't. It's not always clear um, as, as to what exactly somebody needs to do. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. There's a question in the chat here, um, just about the, the time range and that it's fairly broad, uh, stretching from 2030 all the way up to 2050. Do you have any thoughts on that, comments on that? Yeah, I think it's really important um, because I think when we look at, you know, when, especially in a university setting, we have our fiscal years that are one year in length, which is a really short amount of time. And we see that in our political structures too outside of the university when certain terms are only four years and our sustainability strategy, albeit very helpful and a great pathway, is also only five years. And I think that it's really hard to chart out how you're going to make effective long-term change in such short amounts of time. 
So it is a 28 year plan, which is very long and feels quite daunting, but it's also a living document. And it's something we have a foundation for right now, but we're always going to be growing on it. And I think as we review the plan over the years and tailor it to what's happening around the world and at home, it will we'll be thankful that we had something that looked at, at it so broadly in the initial stages is, is, my, uh, is my thought on it. That makes sense. Um, one question here from a staff member, are there any specific um, incentives that are currently available or that you see, you know, coming, becoming available in the future that would help to influence um, students, staff, faculty changes? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think there's a couple things on the student side, as far as transportation goes, uh, there is the EcoPass that, that hopefully will get back up and running after COVID suppresses. I'm not totally sure what the good word to use there is, but but um, reduced transit costs, I think, will be is a huge incentive for students. Uh, we're also looking to have that for staff as well, and that is something that uh, is 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 a slow project, but we are hoping to launch something because we recognize that the cost of transit isn't always accessible or isn't always um, an approachable change when it does mean maybe a longer commute time. Um, what else? I think you could be all of our friends. We're a really fun office and, and anything that you do is making that connection with the office and others alike. And I think that the environmental community is so lovely. So even if it isn't maybe a financial or tangible incentive, it's still being part of something, which is a really nice feeling. Um, and again, not necessarily an incentive, but still when we talked about uh, electric vehicle chargers, still ensuring that that infrastructure is there for you. And so if you did decide to make that leap, we're, we're kind of ready to catch you and we have the infrastructure that you would need to, to safely and, and um, without any bumps make that transition to potentially a, a more sustainable way of life. Those are great to, uh, to look into and to look forward to. One more question here. Um, are there any environmental issues that come to mind for you that are a, a large concern given their potential um, impact on our lives and our health, but that maybe aren't as easily seen or as obvious to folks that, that may have a big impact but aren't publicly seen or talked about as much? Hmm. That's a good question. So looking at something that isn't so tangible, I think I would say weather, but I do think that that's talked about fairly extensively, but still the impacts that that come from more increased and severe weather events. Again, they're so local, they happen instantly and, and, and they sometimes fleet as the news changes. Um, but I think that those things are really important. And especially when we look at, you know, there's there's acute weather events, but then also long term weather events. And what does that mean for people that are living in certain areas and the displacements that we're seeing with people? I think that that's really important. And maybe the latter half of that is something that I don't think is discussed as much uh, is the dis displacement of people from climate change induced weather events. And what does that mean over a long term? Um, and what are, how are we looking at, you know, the amount of space that we have on the planet and what will eventually become in, in inhabitable and, and where do, what do we do with that with the lack of space that we have overall. Good points to think about kind of on a global level. Well, thank you so much, Kale, for that fantastic overview of the Climate Action Plan. We're all looking forward to seeing that this year. Thank you so much for having me present. Thanks again, Kale, um, as Jesse said, for such a clear and concise explanation and breakdown of our plans and where we're headed. Much appreciated by everybody. Um, okay, so next up, our, our second last presentation of the day will be by Joe Ackerman. And Joe is a research associate in the Department of Biosystems Engineering. Joe's current research focuses on post-consumer resource technologies, including gas colored as wastewater filter, biomass and fiber as fuel, compost maturity procedures, and bioplastic from agricultural byproducts. Today, Joe will be sharing information on microplastics and how to reduce exposure to them. Welcome, Joe. Hi. Hi. Can you see me? Yes. All clear. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear me and everything. 
All right. Can see um, you and hear you. Where are you? <laughs> uh, I'm at I'm I'm at work. Um, right, this tiny little room is is where I work. Um, I'm the manager currently. From that bio, I should have updated it. So excuse me for not. I'm going to talk about way more than microplastics. So like that was like um, uh, uh, one of my interests, but my interests have expanded as well as my responsibilities. Uh, so I'm going to show you sort of what I'm doing these days, um, which is managing this very interesting facility. It's called the uh, Sustainability in Action Facility. And um, I spend every day here and I have for quite a while. This is a tiny little office. Um, I have a, a slideshow to bring you. I'm gonna tour you around this space um, kind of after the slideshow. So hopefully I can explain things well enough and um, I can get some uh, interest. Um, maybe there'll be some good questions, but I'll quickly zoom you around here holding my laptop. And so you can see um, some of the things that I talk about in the slideshow. Um, now I understand, I'll just hit, share screen right um and i will share that and i will oh i can't quite see it slideshow you know the little drop down menu is hiding what i need to see here um Why can't I slideshow? I just want a slideshow. This works. How can I get rid of this? Um, whoa. <laughs> Does that help? Help. I'm back. Okay. Well, I'll just do it this way. Okay. Um, this place is called CF. That's what we call it, uh, just for short. So it's sustainable sta sustainability into action facility, and it is on the university campus, um, but it's not downtown. It's a little bit off into Smart Park. At the very end, I've got a map, so I'll I'll show you what um, how to get here. Um, the um, what I'll do is kind of tell you a little bit how I. Um, where I'm at, I, I caught the tail end of, um, of Kale's presentation. So my personal, um, I guess, interest and sort of passion in all that I get to do here is driven by some of the same things. Like I heard uh, that there was like 10 years left before uh, significant climate change, irreversible, um, Life will never be the same again. Um, drastic consequences to um, to CO two levels in the atmosphere happen. Well, and now we're down to eight years. So uh, I guess my attitude is: well, I'm not really doing very much over the next eight years. Uh, might as well get serious. So um, that's you know practically what I'm I'm injecting into my job here. Um, so I try and make things happen and I try and facilitate things happening uh, and it's going pretty well. Um, this is the front of our building. Um, we just got a sign put up. This whole site um, just in Smart Park used to be called the Alternative Village and it was a sort of alternative building techniques um, uh, workshop. Um, graduate studies, playground. Um, a lot of experiments went on here and there's a lot of uh, research carried on and things been published. And um, that professor who was in charge of all of those kinds of things um, has retired and he sort of left all of this um, legacy of very interesting projects, very interesting um, uh, demonstrations and prototypes and pilot scale. Um, alternative energy, um, building techniques, um, and there was actually a fair bit of food production. So my job is to integrate more of the campus into this instead of it just being a little tiny corner of biosystems. 
that a lot of biosystems students didn't even know about it. I'm trying to really break it out into uh, a larger faculty and larger um, all the other faculties. So any course that has something to do with sustainability or alternative energy or you know kind of innovative building, um, food production, all kinds of things, um, you can come here. So to give you an example, um, oh, see, am I able to, are you guys able to see this? Maybe not quite, I hope you can. Um, so this building I'm in right now is made of straw bale. And it is, correct me if anyone knows better, but I believe it is the largest straw bale building in Canada. It's uh, 100 feet long and 40 feet wide and 22 feet high. And what makes straw bale interesting, and this is the sort of research that we like to do here, um, it's if you look at it from an embodied energy perspective, so med and mag joules per kilo of material. Straw bale is, uh, is about a quarter of a megajoule per kilo. And that compares with styrofoam or fiberglass, which both have about 30 megajoules per kilo. Now, granted, you have to you know, be smart and um, normalize that because um, you know, a square foot of, of wall um, is much heavier when you make it out of straw bale than you, when you make it out of styrofoam. So you have to normalize it for, for, for real comparison purposes. So this graph you see, can you see at the bottom, the, the tiny chart? Um, uh, that's all normalized. So you've got the R value uh, per inch and you, how many inches to bring it all up to R40. So you see each one of these materials has got a different kind of you need a different thickness of wall to have the same R value. Um, and consequently, you'd have a different weight. So you can see straw bale is much heavier. However, if you look at uh, embodied energy, um, straw bale comes out just by far the victor, um, you know, 1.75 uh, megajoules per, per square foot of wall area. So um, it's a sort of research that you can do is like, well, yeah, what's better, fiber, fiberglass or styrofoam? Well, how about go bigger and look at um, the carbon footprint and body energy of each of those materials? And um, straw bale has got a lot of great things going for it. Um, you know, you don't have to travel very far to get it. You don't have to use fossil fuels. So there's a bunch of really um, um, uh, highly sort of productive and you know, it makes for a strong case. So that's the sort of thing that we like to do here. And we like to prove it up, uh, actually build it and actually test it. And that goes for um, other areas too. Uh, these are two students that are, uh, they're on co-op um, placement here. They're engineering students. Uh, one's mechanical and one's biosystems. And um, they're learning to sew these guys. So uh, we got some canvas and um, they did a, a whole raft of different things while they were here for eight months last year. And um, they learned to use a treadle sewing machine. So uh, basically what, that's kind of the sort of spirit that uh, I like to bring to things is just to challenge people. Uh, let's let's uh, spread out and try and learn as many new things as possible. Figure out what's the most appropriate use of your time and energy and resources and materials and um, and make it work. Uh, have some fun at the same time. Um, here's, here's another thing that they did, which is, this is part of an, one of the energy systems here. There's solar panels that pump um, in glycol basis. So you basically heat the, heat the glycol in a copper pipe and you bring it from outside in the sun to inside the building. Now these guys made this hot plate and we use it to heat our lunches. Um, so it's, a, it's very practical. Um, uh, these guys learned um, how, how to do pretty good plumbing. Uh, they went from zero to uh, pretty complex plumbing projects. Here's, you'll get to see this when I run around with my laptop at the end. These are two of the solar panels. Now there's, um, 
two kinds of panels. The close one here, there's, there's double. There's two that are the glycol panels, which heat the hot plate. And then the two farther ones are uh, air panels. So they, if the sun was shining much today, that system would be on bringing hot air into the room and replacing the air in the panels with room air. So this a closed loop system, we're basically uh, using the panels, you heat up the, the air and consequently the room bit by bit. Um, we've got other kinds of systems here um, and we bring them all together into one sort of um, kind of command post or observation post where you can look at, at uh, who's making, which system is making what amount of energy and how much of that is making its way into the building. Um, it's because we have a, a wind tower, we have photovoltaics, we have uh, three different solar panels, three different types of solar panels. Um, and we're going to be, you know, every time we get a new system, we'd like to hook it in through here. So that's the, um, that's, that's an example. Here's, I took this photo on a very bright sunny day. So you can see that that red arc. That's the um, uh, the pyranometer, which shows solar incidence. So that's measuring in, in uh, watts per square meter. So one square meter, um, if, the, if you just have a very, very bright, clear day, you have about a thousand watts per square meter, which is equivalent to a hairdryer. So that's a fair bit of power, but that's like potential power. How much of that can you actually bring into your building uh, is another question, because you have losses all the way along the way. Um, and, um, so that's an example. Um, I think this one, you see right above that, the orange line, that's the closed air panel. Um, so that's almost 74 degrees. Um, and that's, that's circulating air. So these systems really do work. Um, this is the last solar system that I want to show you. Um, it's on a, it's a heating system. If you have a building that needs makeup air, say you have a, a school or an office or an apartment block where you have a lot of stale air that you want to push out, um, you have to re that's heated air that you're kind of wasting into the atmosphere. Um, so you have to replace that with outside air, which is fresh, but it's cold. So um, when it's cold, whatever the temperature is outside, uh, minus 30 or minus 40, uh, you have to bring that all the way up to whatever, like uh, 25 degrees in order to circulate it through your building. I guess you probably have to bring it even warm. Um, so this is a preheat of that kind of air. So just these black, uh, steel panels have perforations in them. So they let a little bit of air in. And because the sun strikes, the sun strikes the steel, it heats it up. So that's the airspace in behind, the air gets a little bit warmer. It gets about 20 degrees warmer. So that's 20 degrees warmer than outside air that you don't have to heat it. So this sort of thing really should be on every single building in Winnipeg. There's no reason for this technology not to be um, um, mandated um, because that's that's actually over the course of the winter on we get enough bright sunny days of course it doesn't work in the winter in at night but um, there's enough hours of the day that it it, it would cut heating bills um, substantially um, so that's this is the sort of thing that we do here um, in relation to energy we also work in food production we work in building technologies, um, like I told you, the stack wall, but there's also uh, uh, different kinds of insulation projects that we do. Um, we've built um, stack wall, uh, structural insulated panel research has gone on here. Uh, work on thermal bridges, uh, building envelopes, um, dew points, and that sort of thing. Then there's a whole section on food production. So there's a couple projects going on right now with uh, with uh, northern food, food production, like what would be a smart system um, that would make sense uh, in, in northern latitudes. Um, so there's a couple sea cans that are being retrofitted to try and make uh, either hydroponic or aeroponic systems. Um, 
There's other things also. Um, one that I have is kind of my pet personal peeve uh, is plastic. Geez, there's a, a lot of peas there. Um, so I'm. Uh, we don't actually have something right now. Um, we don't have a grinder or an extruder, uh, but there's pretty strong interest in composting. Uh, there's some research that is about to start, which is um, what is the biodegradability of if you sort of you train a couple bacteria to produce the right kind of enzyme for breaking down both uh, bioplastics um, more quickly and polyethylene more quickly. Um, so that's that's a, a, a um, sort of like a, a, a one of these budding research things, and we're going to put that here as a as a uh, as a project. Um, these uh, the, this is Sean and Ben, uh, the the engineering placement students that were here yes uh, last year. Um, Other things we here are fiber work. So there's a couple projects going on. Uh, these are little gardening like greenhouse potting plant cups made of typha, which is cattail. And that's um, that project is ongoing. And um, there's a bit of uh, some things that get successful have got some business spin-offs. Um, so TNT Seeds, they're interested in what these guys have been doing with, with, uh, with typha. Um, there's, this is a, you have to turn your head on the side. Um, I've converted some of the type to biochar. And biochar has a lot of very interesting qualities. Uh, what, uh, I'm, a, I'm a nutrient guy. So I like to, I'm very uh, curious with biochar as far as a nutrient sponge and what, what will it hold and how long will it hold it and how hard does a plant have to work to take those nutrients off. Um, I find that very interesting. Um, then there's other things that we're doing here. Um, which are more, well, here we go, the plywood library. Uh, we've tried to divert uh, furniture waste out of the university. Instead of it going to the landfill, I try and bring it um, into some sort of secondary use. So we've got this idea of things on their way to the landfill can stop off here. And we'll, the things we want, uh, things that we can see some secondary uses for, We'll take them apart and store them for uh, student projects or um, research purposes to build things like plywood is really uh, useful on very you can use it again and again um, there see there's the racks um, and see oh look i've got the, our data here um, so since really getting going in the first of january we've diverted 1.3 tons um, furniture which is about equivalent to about three tons of CO2. Um, so that's, that's a, there's people coming tomorrow to take things apart. Uh, Kale mentioned that you be an asker for the, for sustainability. And so that's uh, people coming tomorrow to, to take apart furniture. Uh, on our quick little tour, I'll show you some of the things that they'll work on. So where are we? See the white circle down at the bottom? That's where we are. Um, so that's, you know, if you know where oh, DFO is, you kind of go behind that. And, you know, you'll find it. Um, I don't know if this is being recorded, but um, if you give me a shout at uh, uh, joe.ackerman at umanitoba.ca, I will give you reference not yet. Um, there. Okay, so now I'll quit sharing. Stop share. There. Okay. You ready for the tour? This is the last we'll see of this tiny office. Okay, so there. So this is the building. It's about 100 feet long, and we share it with this big red structure, which is belongs to soil science, but they never use it. Um, Oh yeah, architecture. They are doing something pretty interesting in here. There's about 
three or four architecture students that come and work on, um, you know, the SCOBY stuff and mycelium. Um, they're working, trying to make um, kind of building materials. So this area here is for students to gather and do design work. There is Derek Inglis in the back there. Uh, this is the corner that I was telling you about where all of the data gets brought here and you can sort of see right now what's going on like okay what's going on temperature outside minus 12 minus 13 inside the solar wall is minus 10 see there's not much sun going on there's only uh, 300 watts per square meter so it's kind of there you can put your sandwich and warm it up So this area here, which is kind of full, we just received a shipment today for one of the project students. Um, they're working on uh, something in the greenhouse. Um, these are pieces of furniture that we're gonna take apart tomorrow. This whole area is workshop area. So this is where uh, projects will get built if you got a prototype. Um, And hopefully we don't lose our connection. So this is what it looks like. There's our solar panels. There's a student project that is turning this into a growing chamber. Right behind here is the greenhouse, which I probably shouldn't take you in there because I'll lose the connection. There's two biomass boilers in here, in this green one, along with the Stirling engine. Um, Stirling engine, which Come on by and I'll tell you all about it. Um, inside there is where the plywood library storage is. This is a, a hempcrete building. Um, there you can see the wind tower. It's probably making about 200 watts right now. Uh, it gets up to about 900 watts, but the, the wind's gotta be howling for that. So um, that's just about my tour. I would take you in the greenhouse, but I'm sure I'll lose, you lose the connection. We're on Wi-Fi here, and it's very weak. Okay. So I think I'm open for questions. Hi, Joe. Thanks. Thanks for showing us all the projects and tour. There's lots going on. <laughs> There is a question here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, here's a good question. How would you persuade big companies to use material for energy that has a much lower carbon 14 footprint, but provides less energy? But however, it's overall more efficient, just not as much energy all at once. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's a, the energy thing is a very, um, kind of a deep question because we have gotten used to basically free energy, like oil and gas were given to us. Um, we didn't work for them. The sun doesn't make them on an annual basis. Um, things like, you know, if you're burning biomass every year, the sun makes it or the, you know, the whole ecosystem on the earth makes it. Whereas oil and gas were made millions of years ago. And um, we've just sort of stumbled upon them. And it's like they're free. But they're not really free because we're paying a huge price now for them. Um, whereas a more balanced system is, uh, you know, alternative energies like, like solar, like wind, like biomass, um, that you sort of, you have to rein in your consumption because you can't really um, use more than is produced. And so to me, that's like the main thing about energy consumption. You have to bring it down. Um, you have, you know, try and get along with half of what you get along with now um, and then try and have it again. Once you, you know, get the first milestone, yeah. then do it again. Um, so generally when something like, biomass or wind energy or solar is compared they're compared with one that is free you know it's sort of like 
you know, the first oil boom was not fossil fuels, it was whale oil. And it was just seen as like, wow, you just go out there, you harpoon, you know, one of these millions of whales that is swimming around out there, you go to some little island and you render it all down and put it in barrels and bring it back and you, you heat your lamps and everything and, and your streets with it and you light your streets and isn't that great? Like, but it's not sustainable. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of a bad idea. <laughs> so does, yeah. does that answer well enough? Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. Um, no, that's definitely helped a little bit. Um, I've got a couple more. I think we have a couple minutes here. Um, just quickly, looking at your plywood library, what's the reoccurring product or item that's coming through that doesn't have much use? Like, is there better? Is there a way to reevaluate the materials that we bring into campus that end up in that in your shop in your library? You have hit the nail on the head, Juanita. <laughs> because really, the campus should have a furniture buying strategy. Um, currently, the, it should have one. <laughs> I don't think it's got one at all. But it it should get one that is by its own nature sustainable. Currently, um, office furniture lasts about six years, six or seven years mm -hmm. before it's just thrown out. Whether or not it's broken, um, it's thrown out because you know they changed the carpet or the curtains or you know the desk got changed up and like oh well this sort of thing yeah it's, um, so like mm -hmm. off it goes. And I see being privy to how much waste goes to landfill from, from the university. Um, you just say like, this is ridiculous. We're throwing mm -hmm. out this perfectly good furniture. Um, and some of that style, some of its color, some of it's poorly made, you know, like the wheel goes on an office chair and suddenly the, you can't replace the wheel. So you have to throw it out. Um, it's like, yeah. you can't use a chair that only has, has three wheels. Um, there's other things too, you know, like the whole use of chipboard and malamine on the top, you know, like, like basically all, basically every piece of furniture you have, like if you look around you, it's all the same. Um, those things, like compared to plywood, you can't, you can't even tighten a screw in those, you know, it's the screw strips. Um, and it's, it's got no strength, so you can't really reuse it again. So there's a, a lot of place to improve buying. So figure, just to figure out like, okay, what, after a primary usage, is there, let's have a secondary use and maybe a third, um, instead of being like, well, the color doesn't match or um, the wheel's broken and it's gonna go. Yeah. So I would really encourage, um, someone, you know, maybe one of these ambassadors to, to draw up a template of what furniture buying policy could be here. Because I don't, I haven't got any figures. I don't know what we spend as a university on furniture every year, but I imagine it's, it's, there's big numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a new project idea. Thank you. Um, if someone has an idea or a project in mind, um, how do they go about working or starting the project with the facility? What is, what's first steps? Oh, talk to me. Yeah. Go to yeah. you directly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Which just from Allison. Yeah. Hey, Allison. I just saw that. <laughs> she, she, she's like my partner in the, uh, in the plywood library. She's like the one who sends me stuff from physical plant. Um, figures out like, okay, what's, what's been deemed as, as useless and um, got to get it out of here. And so she says, okay, Joe could use this and this and this, and she has them send it to me. So, but there's, Again, there's yeah. still so much room for, for more, you know, I'm, I'm doing a little fraction yeah. of what could be. But a good reminder to visit, utilize the reshop, um, U of M's furniture recycling program too. It's good to reiterate that here. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. I, I don't know if, if what I did was um, recorded, but we made a film about the plywood library. It's called the, and it's on YouTube. It's called mm -hmm. the F Waste Championships. 
if anyone wants to look it up. Okay. Um, I think we're out of time, Joe. I think we're out of time, but there's a couple more questions. Um, I they're in the chat. If you don't mind, um, okay. Shall I go and just could, type yeah. answers? Okay. We'll we'll type up some answers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah. Bye bye. Great, Allison. Okay, I think it's back over to me now. So thank you, Joe. Thanks, Juanita. Uh, our next presenter is Christina Hunter. So Christina is a former senior instructor here at the University of Manitoba, where she taught sustainability related courses for 20 years and worked with many committees and student groups to advance sustainability on campus and even worked to establish the University of Manitoba's Office of Sustainability, along with her colleagues and students. Uh, Christina served as Vice Chair of the Manitoba Roundtable for Sustainable Development for nearly 10 years, advising the provincial government on sustainability policies and programs, especially related to waste reduction, green buildings, and sustainability reporting. Christina now has a podcast and online program where she helps caring, eco-conscious, early career professionals go from feeling overwhelmed, which happens all too often uh, with the state of the planet and trying to do everything to be confident that they are focusing on the right things so that they can make an impact without burning out. Please welcome Christina Hunter. So nice to see you. Christina, if you can hear me, I think you might be Thanks frozen. Thanks so much, Kale. It's oh, lovely to see are. everybody here. Okay, sorry about that. Internet, yeah, happens. <laughs> How am I doing now? You're good. good a little, connection? a little spotty, but I think uh, we, you're you're moving again, and and so I think we're good. <laughs> All right, I'm. I don't know. No one else is home. It's just me using the internet. So hopefully we're good for this connection. Um, I'd love to share my screen with you, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I know you guys have been here, many of you, maybe all day already, but um, I'm really glad you've uh, stuck around this far. I know you've got some lovely um, awards coming up right after this, so that's beautiful. And um, hi, shout out to anybody who I know already in, uh, in the conference, but yeah, feel free to give me a little hello in the chat. And um, I would love to, to see any of those familiar faces, but uh, if I don't have a face, maybe a familiar name in the chat would be lovely. So I'm just going to share my screen with you if you're okay with that. And um, just let me give you that one. So as Kale mentioned, I had taught at the university for 20 years and I taught all sorts of courses and so on, but now I do other things. I teach through a podcast and I have an online program called the Eco Impact Academy. And I'm just so excited that the Office of Sustainability and the committee that made the decisions about what to present here today decided to include some discussion about self-care. So that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today, why it's an essential tool for actually making change in this world. So that's where we are headed. Oh dear, there we go. All right, um, so that's me and um, I, I'm really grateful to be here and chatting with you all. Um, I, as you know, taught here for at the university for about 20 years and I spent my whole career in sustainability looking at how to make organizations, government and people live greener lives. And I've taught a variety of courses, including sustainable Manitoba and green building and planning and in uh, the MBA program, managing for sustainable development and all those kinds of things. And um, I noticed along the way that my students and myself have been experiencing something that we tend to call now ecological grief. And it's, it's a real issue and it's quite a problem. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today and how to combat that through self-care. So there are some really good techniques around this, but first let's just talk about that a little bit. This concept of ecological grief has come about and we've heard numerous um, other terms now talked about when this concept comes up around um, climate grief, or sometimes it's called eco-anxiety, or even solastalgia 
nostalgia, which is similar to the word nostalgia, but it's a form of sickness that really has to do with your environment changing and um, your feelings about that, the, the sense of loss when we see our natural environment changing or our, our home environment changing um, due to these external forces such as climate change. Um, and, you know, this one paper that came out in January of 2021 in this Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health even talked about some of the surveys that have been done recently about this that found like 56% of, of rural Australians were worried about climate change and even 29% of Americans in a different survey were very worried and 64 were a little worried. And in Europe, in uh, the countries that were surveyed there, France, Germany, Great Britain, and Norway, found 30% of the population surveyed was very or extremely worried. And these related to having fears around climate change or feeling emotions like outrage and guilt and other, you know, real anxiety about these changes. So if you guys have experienced any of this, please feel free to pop that in the chat because I know that's very, very common and something that I too have experienced. And I wanted to make sure that we have some tools to, to kind of manage it and deal with it. And in fact, it's become so prevalent that the American Psychology Association has even described eco-anxiety and they call it the chronic fear of environmental cataclysm that comes from observing the seemingly in irrevo irrevocable impact of climate change and the associated concern for one's future and that of next generations. So it's something real that a lot of people experience. Now, it doesn't, um, it's not classified as an illness or anything like that, but the reality is it is another pressure and another stressor on our mental health and wellness. And when we combine this with a pandemic <laughs> that we're, you know, still actually in and um, global conflict with the invasion of Ukraine and all of the other stressors that you feel in your day to day life, just pressures around, you know, school and deadlines and so on. This all adds up to, you know, real concerns around mental health and well being and really wanting to make a difference. But sometimes you're just kind of stuck and you don't really know how. So that's just what I wanted to help out with talking about today because I remember very, very vividly one day. A number of years ago, I was walking my dog in the woods along the river, you know, in my, my little river trail here in the city that I love walking and I walk all the time. But it struck me as um, a real insight that to actually care for myself, for my well being, for my body, for my physical health, for my mental health, for my spiritual health, is actually the same as caring for the planet. Why is that? Because we, me, and all of us are also beings of this earth. And as such, we deserve to be well. And when we do self care right in a way that's good for the planet, it's actually doing so much more benefit to us and for our broader interests. So that's what I wanted to get to today, how to care for ourselves, understanding that it is a part of caring for the natural world and how to do it in a way that is good for the planet. So it doesn't uh, surprise us, perhaps, that caring for the planet is uh, important to us. It's actually, we know we are biologically connected to the natural world, right? We absolutely need this thing called nitrogen. And even though the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, can we just breathe it in and absorb it? No, right? We can't. We can't process that nitrogen. It's not biologically available. Who does that for us? Well, soil microbes. They actually fix that nitrogen and bring it into the food web and process it and then other soil microbes bring it back out into the atmosphere. And that is all done through soil microbes. And that nitrogen is integral to us. It gets integrated into our DNA. So when we say we are a part of nature, yes, we are philosophically, spiritually, we can be part of nature, 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 but biologically, we are part of nature. We are nature. And so it's not surprising that when we see environmental harm and degradation, it 
it's difficult for us. It harms us emotionally as well as physically. So that's very understandable, but how do we deal with it? The way that David Suzuki uh, talks about it, he says, our identity includes our natural world, how we move through it, how we interact with it, and how it sustains us. So it's not surprising that this should be something that is vitally important to us because it really is who we are biologically as well as socially and spiritually and so on. So this is really um, not surprising that we feel this uh, deep connection and when nature is hurting, so are we. So let's talk about that and how it plays out in our actions. Well, we know that we have been expanding our definition of what is sustainable, right? In early days, we used to talk about sustainability as being social sustainable and socially sustainable and ecologically and economic sustainability. And when those three things came together, that was our first definition of sustainability. But now we've expanded that to really include, well, we need political sustainability and good governance and we need health of our people. And that includes mental health, physical health, spiritual health. And we also are looking for equality and justice and um, it, the reduction of inequities and um, environmental injustices and so on. So this is really now our much expanded definition of what sustainability is. So it shouldn't be surprising to us that self-care components integrate with a, so many of these aspects of this broader definition of sustainability. Now you've seen this already today, but um, these sustainable development goals very clearly all at least directly or indirectly relate to human health in some way as well, right? Because certainly we want to have um, good life below water in order to have healthy people. But very directly, 11 of those 17 that I've highlighted here have direct connections to human health and well being. So, really, when we take care of our health and well being, we are also working towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So, that's an important context to put this in. Now, if we talk about self-care as part of caring for the planet, sometimes we might think about things when we talk about the word self-care. Well, what is it? Is it a hot bath? Sure, maybe. Uh, and maybe a hot bath doesn't fix it, right? Or is it getting your nails done? That's what a lot of you know women might think of when they think about self-care. Or is it sitting down to some, some of your favorite shows and, and binge, binge watching and uh, having all the snacks you want? Well, actually, those things are not real self-care. The self-care that in the literature is actually helping us feel better in the long run is quite different. It's quite a bit more active and it involves those things that you know are good for you. Exercise, eating right, finding community, spending time in nature. And those things, when we do those right, we can also be caring for the planet at the same time. So you see the difference. It's a little bit different than what we might be thinking about as self-care, which might be harmful to the planet or not good for um, equity in terms of society. If the people doing your nails aren't being paid a fair living wage, or if you're using a lot of hazardous chemicals with that. So we really want to think carefully about our self-care activities. So let's get into that. There are, there's proven evidence for all of these things in terms of actually doing well for our mental and physical health in the long run. Eating right, exercising, spending time in nature, meditating or practicing mindfulness, expressing gratitude, finding a sense of community, which is part of what you're doing here, right? Being with other people, even if it's online, with other people who have uh, common values, share your ideas around how we should live, celebrating successes when we have them, and sleeping right. So I know life is busy. You've got tests, you've got all sorts of um, assignments, and you're pulled in all different directions, and plus you've got to do laundry and then feed yourself. So it's really, really hard to do. But in you know, in the end, we probably have a pretty good sense of what is actually good for us, but it can be hard to make it a priority. And sometimes we have conflicting information or conflicting priorities. 
should I go to the gym or should I go to bed on time? Or, um, you know, should I study longer? Um, or sometimes we just have that mentality. Should I, I just need to tough it out. It's just this period of time. It's just this semester. It's just until. And the truth is, there's never really a great time to um, say how oh, I've got loads of free time. I should engage in self-care. It's not that easy. Um, and it's very, very common for us to just defer and say, I'll do that later and never actually get to it. So let's talk about some ways to integrate really good self-care that's good for us and for the planet on a regular basis. So I've got a very simple little mnemonic here for you to remember it by. The A, B, Z, <laughs> or A, B, Zs maybe. Uh, if I were a better Canadian, I'd have to say Z, but uh, it's easy to remember, A, B, Z. And A stands for acknowledge, B is body and mind, and Z, well, you guess that, right? Put your guess in the kid chat, please. <laughs> Let me know. Are you on, on board with that? All right, so here's what it looks like. First of all, I'm really encouraging you to acknowledge. You're probably already doing stuff that's good for the planet. And when these things are weighing you down, when these, this sense of ecological grief, of solastalgia, of climate grief, eco-anxiety, they're getting to you, I really encourage you to go back to this list. I'd love for you to do this right now or later on today, is to acknowledge what you're already doing that's good for the planet, for other people, and for your own health. Are you already picking up litter when you see it? Are you already a conscious consumer, careful to buy things that are not as harmful for the planet? Do you wear clothing from the thrift store? Do you volunteer at the community garden? It's great places to start. I know you're doing something. So what are those things? Here's the little activity to help you on the acknowledge front. Just write down in a notebook these categories and sure, tailor them, make them your own, um, add other ones if that suits you better. But I encourage you to look at categories like food, consumer goods, your housing, your transportation, your finances, and how you spend your time. And in each of those categories, just jot down the number of things that you are already doing that are either good for the planet, good for society, or good for your physical and mental health. I bet you're already doing good stuff. So let's give yourself a moment to celebrate those things that you are doing because it's going to give you some perspective on it because I know these issues can seem so big and so daunting that we don't even know how to tackle them. So let's first ground ourselves in the understanding that we're already doing something good. Okay, so that's A, acknowledge. Then B, body and mind. It turns out basically whatever is good for your body is also good for your mind almost unilaterally across the board. So that's pretty easy and that's a good thing to remember. Sometimes we think about, oh, I'm gonna protect my mental health and I'm just going to veg out on the couch. That's actually not that good for your mental health in the end because it's, it's not that good for your body. So generally, it's all the stuff your mom tells you to do, probably, right? Like eat well, exercise, sleep, see your friends, those kinds of things. They're actually really good for you. So how can we engage in some of that? Well, let's just look at food very quickly. You know there are lots of reasons to tackle food. From an environmental perspective, we know that large-scale agriculture has all kinds of issues. It's depleting the soil organic matter. It's uh, associated with poor animal wet. How are we doing there? Is Hey, Christina, you cut out for maybe three seconds there. So uh, last thing we got was animal webs. Okay, thank you so much. Am I back okay here? Yep, yep, I'm good on my end at least, yep. Okay, my apologies. I don't know why this uh, connection's a little bit bad, but um, so anyways, you know we have issues with large-scale agriculture. It's actually not good for the environment on a you know, when we talk broad strokes, not everything is bad about it, but there are certainly issues with reduced um, soil fertility, loss of um, soil organic matter, etc. And then when it comes to our health, we see increasing problems, increasing obesity, 
food inequity, food deserts in cities where people can't get, you know, high quality, nutritious whole foods in lots of areas in the city center, for example. And we generally have fewer connections to our food. We have a lack of the understanding of how to cook food and process food that our generations prior had much more knowledge in. And we have an increasing obsession with body image, which isn't that healthy either for men and for women. So what can we do on this front? We certainly have lots of room to move here. I love this quote from Jamie Oliver, and he's the British food guy, you've probably heard of him. And he says, nourish to me is nourishing food, nourishing your family, nourishing your life. So when we think of food, we can definitely think of it from more than just a caloric standpoint. We really can be thinking of it as what it does for us as a whole, as an individual, how it contributes to social fabric, to getting together with friends over a great meal, what it means to um, integrating our, our culture into our lives. And I know so many people lose that or get distanced from it when they move away from home. And it also means the health and healthy benefits that we get from eating healthy food. So it's pretty simple, eat whole foods, eat local, eat fresh, eat in season, cook. <laughs> simple cook I know it doesn't seem simple but it actually is just go online simple recipes there you go um, avoid processed foods eat lower on the food chain I mean that's that's a, a general for health and for the environment eat in moderation enjoy your food enjoy it enjoy it with other people and enjoy it's uh, allowing you to connect with the earth and support local organic and small-scale producers Grow your own food if you can. Um, there are loads of benefits. We're reducing our carbon footprint. We're increasing animal welfare. We're increasing food security. We're increasing equality and improving soil health when you do these types of things. Other basics, exercise, it feels good. It increases your energy. It reduces illness and disease and it improves your mental health and cognitive ability, helps you connect to nature and provides us with community. It can be a new type of ritual and it's empowering to be exercising, to move your body. Yoga has been shown to have all kinds of benefits, including to your sleep and body awareness and mental problems and happiness and all that kind of stuff. So how do we do that? Well, you don't all have to do yoga, but just start with what you already enjoy. Do you love to play soccer? Play soccer, okay, if you can, right? Um, what, what are you already doing? Just getting out for a walk, do more of it. Um, find some community and just move for the joy of it. It doesn't have to be competition. It doesn't have to be tracked. Um, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be good at it. You just have to have fun with it. Start very small. Avoid injury if you can, please. Take a class and just enjoy what you do. Lots of you guys know I still play ultimate frisbee. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. But at this point in my life, I just play to keep playing. I just wanna have fun, do something good out there and keep on doing it. Uh, and I encourage you to play to keep playing. So many people lose their connection to the sports that they were doing in high school once they get into university because they want to get serious about their studies. Now, I know during pandemic, it's been wild and crazy, but I really encourage everybody to think about exercise in a way that would add to their life. I did a podcast about how to get outside in nature in under an hour. So feel free to have a look at that one. Um, but spending time in nature is another thing that has been shown to be beneficial to our mental health and wellness. It helps our self-esteem and productivity and your mood and your cognition. If you wanna do better on a test, spend 10 minutes outdoors first and then go study or come back to it after you have spent time uh, in nature. It's actually shown to be beneficial. So it has all kinds of benefits to our physical health and um, it's really useful for social cohesion if you go out with a group of friends and do something in nature. And it also helps our spiritual well-being, gives us a greater sense of purpose and belonging and interdependence with the natural world. So there are so many benefits. How to do that? Well, can you just reassess where nature is? Do you think it's out in the park where you have to drive out there in the week, on the weekend or where you go camping? It's not. I mean, nature is just 
all around us, for heaven's sakes. You take a deep breath. You're, you're taking in nature, right? Um, you want to enjoy it more, look out the window. Spend a bit of time outdoors. Can you just do some reading outdoors? Can you do your um, commuting by active transportation rather than by taking a car or bus? Um, just dress for it. Or just take your coffee outdoors even when it's this cold, I know. I just did an, uh, um, a birthday dinner outdoors with my friends not too long ago in this cold. Um, we can get creative with it. Um, you can do that. And there are all kinds of interesting challenges, a thousand hours outdoors for kids or doing interesting programs like forest and nature therapy. And as we do these actions, I really want you to think about a broader definition of what happiness is. Happiness, the fleeting kind of happiness that we get from things like consumer goods or um, maybe just having a snack or a treat is actually not the depth of happiness that we can find through taking on activities that are also good for the planet. It turns out there's a term for it and it's called sustainable happiness that was coined by Catherine O'Brien in 2005. And that's the pursuit of happiness that does not exploit other people, the environment or future generations. And it turns out it's pretty easy to do that. Just look to see if your actions have a connection between you and other people. Does this action lead to suffering or inequality? Then it, it doesn't relate to sustainable happiness. Does it, um, what about the connections between you and the natural world? Does this action lead to degradation of the environment? Then that's not the right activity. And understanding how it relates to your own physical and mental well-being. Does it improve your body and mind? then we're looking at something that would qualify as sustainable happiness and one of these activities that are great for your body and mind. All right, I've just got a few minutes left. Let's wrap it up with the sleep. Um, it turns out all adults need seven to nine hours a night. Are you getting seven to nine hours? If you are, like, kudos to you. Okay. <laughs> If you are getting that, just put it in the chat. I would love to know, seriously. But it turns out it's not always that easy. We have all these competing priorities, and it's not always easy to sleep for, for some people. Here are some keys based on evidence. There's a lot of interesting research around sleep. Turns out if you stick to a schedule, go to bed, and wake up at the same time, that really helps you get good sleep. And um, exercise is great for sleep. Not recommended to do it right before bedtime. Avoiding caffeine and nicotine after 12 noon. You should avoid nicotine anyways, just for your health. And avoiding alcohol before bed. It turns out alcohol, alcohol is a sedative, but it doesn't give you quality sleep. So it's different than having a good night's sleep. And avoiding large meals at night, which you probably noticed on your own, and getting outdoors in the morning can help your body see that this is uh, the time for daylight and cue it into waking up properly. And um, just allowing yourself to relax before bed. So being away from screens and being away from the mental work of you know, your, your homework, your schoolwork, or other mentally taxing things before bed. So those are the basics, but I encourage you to think about just reframing some of these actions because they seem like chores, right? Now I have to cook for myself too, or I have to get out to the gym more, get outside more, it seems like a chore, but can we reframe it and think about how we respond to these situations in a way as being something that is good for myself? It's a, a gift to my wellness and maybe also a gift to the planet. So. I like this quote, we, we can't always change our situation, but we can change our response to it. Okay, so we're busy. How do you want to respond to that busy? By shoving junk food into your mouth? Or do you want to respond to it by taking a beat, making some healthy food, sharing a bit of a meal with friends, and feeling a lot better, and then performing better as a result? We can make that choice if we just reframe how we respond to it. All right, you guys. I'll leave you with a quote. This is from Oprah Winfrey. She says, find your lane, make space for the flow to show itself. Follow the natural rhythm of your life and you will discover a force far greater than your own. All right. I, I love doing this all and it's um, lovely to see you interested in this. Please find your own best uh, self-care practices and create a little plan for yourself. 
I actually have a little download for you if you want. It's a self-care kit that looks like this and you can download it and fill it in and put it on your phone. I'd love to send it to you. Just send me an email um, through my website. I'm at christinahunterflourishing.com. I've got a website and um, a blog and all kinds of resources there. And uh, you can just get in touch with me through my contact page. I would absolutely love to hear from you. I'm actually doing a little bit of research on people who are feeling kind of overwhelmed from all of these environmental strains in, in the world and um, our responses to that. So I would really love to talk to you if you have half an hour to have a chat with me on Zoom. I would really appreciate that. Um, just put the let me know in the chat here or um, get in touch with me through my website just on the contact page would be the best way. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Christina. That was, pun intended, such a breath of fresh air. So really appreciate you highlighting all of these really important things and, and just kind of bringing it down to those individual actions that we wouldn't normally notice. So um, I have one question for you before I introduce our next speaker. And uh, it's a fun one. We were doing Meatless Mondays on our social media for a while. Just to promote, um, you know, accessible, approachable meals, because sometimes cooking can feel really daunting. And I know you had mentioned um, just going and cooking in your presentation. So do you have a favorite meal that, I mean, don't have to share a recipe, but what's your favorite go-to right now that doesn't take too much time? I absolutely have a favorite meal and it's, um, I call it my Mediterranean bowl. It's super easy. Okay. If you want, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world. You can do some quinoa or any grain. I like quinoa or barley and, uh, but you can skip that too. I use, I take a yam, chop it up, toss it in some oil, roast it. I take some chickpeas, drain them, toss them in the same oil with the yams and some seasoning salt and roast them. And then I sprinkle on top some feta cheese if I have it, maybe some olives and uh, an avocado and some hummus and have it with a pita. It is amazing. <laughs> that sounds absolutely delicious. Yeah. And um, so a grain bowl is amazing. That's my Mediterranean one. And um, I posted about it, but if you let me know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a recipe. I'd be happy to send it to you. That's awesome. Maybe we will when this uh, this will be all recorded and we'll share it. So maybe we'll put that in the little bio, the recipe, if you don't mind. That would be fun. That's good. Amazing question. Thanks, Kale. Yeah, of course. So there's a lot of comments coming in really just saying thank you so much. We miss your teaching, uh, simplicity on the meals. So just thank you in general for, for taking the time and joining us today. We really appreciate it. You know what, I, I'm so grateful to be here and I thank you very much for including this discussion of self-care and um, I'm still teaching. I have a program I've just run the beta version of, it's called the Eco Impact Academy and, um, and I'm doing this research. So I would really love if anybody wants to talk to me, just reach out. I'd love to hear from you and all you wonderful students out there who I know. <laughs> so it's really wonderful to see everyone here. That's a really good point. You're not teaching on campus, but you are still teaching. Um, yeah. Do you mind putting your contact information or your website in the chat just so anyone that's watching has easy access to contact you? Will do. And I see okay. Terry Duguid is here and I'm, I'm very happy to have him here. So I won't take any more of his time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Christina. Take care. You too. Um, yes, so really quickly on that note, I did want to mention that the Office of Sustainability is working on resources and events to help students with eco and climate anxiety. Uh, it is such an important topic and we're hoping that the resources um, for everything is being done by an NRI student, which Dr. Uh, Flumetralina had mentioned earlier. Uh, so please stay tuned for this, for all of these resources that will hopefully be coming up in the near future. And now that does conclude the formal presentations for the 2022 Sustainability Day. So to thank all the pre presenters and to close out the day, I would like to welcome Mr. Terry Duguid to give a few remarks before we head into the Sustainability Award portion of the day. Terry, nice to see you, over to you. It's, it's uh, really great to, to be with you, Kale. It's great to see uh, Christina and I saw the last part of her presentation there, good practical advice. Uh, that I'm not, I must admit, not following to the letter, uh, but uh, I, I'll try and do better. I'm certainly not getting seven to nine hours of sleep, so uh, 
but it is uh, it's very very important but uh i'm joining you from uh, treaty one territory the homeland of the Na metis nation from my home here in uh, in white ridge and uh, it's uh, great to join you for uh, sustainability day and uh, the sustainability awards that i believe uh, follows uh, uh, after i speak so i'm really looking forward to uh, uh to seeing uh uh, the awardees and hearing about uh, their their projects and their uh, interests and uh, I hope we, we can all be in person next year. I, I'm a regular at the Sustainability uh, Awards uh, uh, Day and uh, I've always enjoyed uh, the amazing presentations uh, from, from students and faculty and um, I'm hoping that uh, we can all be together so that uh, we can uh, break bread and uh, and share knowledge uh, uh, together. Uh, so let me uh, let me thank all of the presenters. Uh, I I missed them today. I'm sorry. We've had a a really crazy day in uh, in Winnipeg with visiting ministers, and so. Uh, but I'm 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 glad that I'm able to join you for these last uh, these last this last part of 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 your day. A great theme today. Uh, the 17. Uh, sustainable development goals, which we should always have in the front of our minds when we're thinking about uh, sustainability. And importantly, I really want to give a shout out and to uh, congratulate all of the awardees for their hard work in their fields and uh, and for keeping sustainability front and center uh, here in, uh, in our community of Winnipeg and Manitoba. Uh, for my part, I've really enjoyed uh, working with the university on sustainability issues. I've been working very closely with your uh, president, Michael Benarosh, your uh, VP of uh, research. Uh, uh, you know, our government, uh, uh, big believer in, in science and evidence, and um, the University of Manitoba is well known and excels in the areas of climate change, infectious diseases, reconciliation, all that are are, are topics uh, very much that are front and center in in, in the in the sustainability uh, movement um, uh, on ongoing and uh, I'm, I'm I'll give you a little teaser uh, I will be at the university next week to uh, make an announcement on uh, climate change and agriculture we know that agriculture is is a specialty of the university it was founded uh, in the agricultural uh, sciences and but we know that we have to conduct our, our uh, agriculture in a more environmentally friendly more sustainable way and so we'll be making uh, an announcement uh, the federal government will uh, in partnership with the university and with other uh, community actors on um, making our agriculture more uh, sustainable uh, a couple of building expansions uh, on on campus, the new innovation hub, which is doing cutting edge uh, research, uh, and some of it uh, related to sustainability involving the private sector, sector, academia, students, uh, business, uh, local businesses, uh, and um, maybe just a, a little bit to, if you're interested in how I'm involved in sustainability each and every day. And we very much rely on our university community to provide us uh, with the knowledge uh, to, shape, uh, to shape policy uh, so that uh, we can build a more sustainable com uh, community, country, and, and world. And in light of the, new, the, uh, the latest uh, IPCC UN uh, report, uh, we know that uh, Climate change is an existential uh, crisis. It is upon us, and uh, we not only have to um, very aggressively reduce our emissions, emissions, but we have to adapt uh, as well. So I'm very, very fortunate to be working with our environment minister, uh, the Honorable Stephen Gilbo. I was just on uh, a Zoom with him about an hour ago, and very, very shortly we'll be uh, coming forward with an emissions reduction plan that will get us to that 40, 45 percent. Uh, reduction uh, in emissions that we committed to uh, uh, first in Paris and and then in uh, in in the UK and Glasgow um, and uh, by the end of 2022 we will have a national adaptation strategy in place and I've been asked to uh, play a special role by the Prime Minister uh, on the freshwater file 
And I don't have to tell the folks on the screen today that uh, Manitoba is so blessed with the 11th largest freshwater body in the world, Lake Winnipeg. Uh, our city is located at the junction of two uh, major rivers. We've had the worst drought in 70 years last year and, and the worst floods in 300 years uh, in, in, uh, in recent memory in the last uh, decade that have impacted agriculture, our First Nations communities, and and uh, our our environment and our our economy and so uh, uh, much of my inspiration comes from uh, the knowledge we gain from our university community our researchers uh, our administrators uh, our educators because you are uh, producing the next generation of environmental uh, leaders and i think we're going to see that on display when we uh, when the awards are handed out so I'm uh, really looking forward to, to that, and um, and I'll be staying on the line for the next little while to see who our winners are. So uh, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, do call on me anytime if I can uh, I can be of help. Uh, I'm on I'm on campus pretty regularly to uh, interact with both your administrators and your researchers. So. Uh, happy Sustainability Day, and I think you'll agree every day should be Sustainability Day. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Duvet. Uh, we appreciate you attending the event uh, and your ongoing support for climate action and also for the University of Manitoba. We appreciate you taking the time to come today. Um, so thank you. I would now like to move on to the exciting kind of conclusion of our day, which is our U of M Sustainability Awards. Um, so for those of you that are just tuning in for the award portion here, uh, my name is Christy Aaron. I am the Director of Sustainability here at the University of Manitoba, and I'll just be leading you through the awards um, in the next few minutes. So I'm just going to share my screen here, and hopefully I don't ruin anything. I'm really bad at technology. Uh, just give me one second. Okay. Okay. Uh, too many screens open here. All right, can you see the presentation? Somebody give we can. me a good Great, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> All right, so the Sustainability Awards happen annually to recognize and celebrate the collaborative efforts of students, staff, and faculty to advance their campus commitment to excellence and leadership in sustainability. It is believed that these award winners efforts on campus demonstrate leadership, advocacy, and a measurable and lasting impact on the sustainable development goals. This year, we will be announcing six awards for undergraduate student, graduate student, student group, faculty, and staff with a bonus category for a collaborative group. The award winners are selected by members of the award selection subcommittee of the UM Sustainability Committee. This group consists of students, faculty, and administrative members. If you happen to be a lucky recipient of a sustainability award, uh, your award will be delivered to you in the coming days. And I have an example here. I'm just gonna cover up the winner, um, but this is what it looks like. Hard to see with my background. It's a nice etched piece of wood, um, but it is a very esteemed award on behalf of our, our office and uh, sustainability at University of Manitoba. Um, so when we do call your name, if we do, feel free to unmute yourself and say a few words. At the very least, if you aren't comfortable with that, at least give us a brief wave so that the audience um, can acknowledge you and show our appreciation for uh, what you have done. So first up is our Undergraduate Student Sustainability Award. This award recognizes an undergraduate student who has led an initiative or a project to advance one or more of the sustainable development goals. This initiative or project can be part of their coursework or take place outside of the learning environment. The winning student must be a full or part-time undergraduate student in good standing and currently enrolled at the University of Manitoba. So I would like to congratulate Mr. Justin Langan. Um, Justin, I just have a little bio here. Justin has been a passionate advocate for surrounding climate change and climate adaptation, especially here at the university. He was recently recognized nationally as one of the top 25 environmentalists under 25 by Starfish Canada. 
Some of his involvements include participating in sessions with Indigenous Climate Action, volunteering in dialogue sessions with community elders, and the Manitoba Métis Federation on how to better protect and sustain the environment, especially the boreal forest. Congratulations to Justin. Would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, thank you. Like, it's an incredible honor, um, especially from the university community for this. You know, I have a great passion for sustainability, climate adaptation, and um, just this recognition of the work I've done, especially with the Indigenous community, um, is really, it's really a big honor for me. And I just have to thank you and everyone here for this. Um, uh, for the few hours we've been here, it's just been great listening to everyone. And I'm really inspired more than ever just to put in more work, you know, every day. So thanks again. And it's an absolute honor. So thank you. Thanks, Justin. We appreciate you being here. And it sounds like you've been here all day. So that's an added bonus. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up is our Graduate Sustainability Award. This award recognizes a graduate student who has led an initiative or project to advance one or more of the sustainable development goals. This initiative or project can be part of coursework or take place outside of the learning environment. Nominees must be a full or part-time graduate student in good standing and currently enrolled at the University of Manitoba. I would like to announce that the winner is Mr. William Dowie. Uh, Bill is a 30 year plus environmental consultant. He holds an applied management certificate for nonprofit organizations, a master's certificate in project management, and he's a certified permaculture designer, master gardener, and accredited lead professional. A former instructor in the prairie horticulture, uh, he continues to coach homeowners as an independent ecological landscaper. He is the past VP of the UMGSA and has served on several boards and committees within the university, nonprofits, and government. So I'd like to congratulate Bill on this award. Is Bill here to say a few words? I don't know if I've seen his name pop up. I am, Christy. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, good to go. All right. It's been, um, it's been a privilege to be part of the University of Manitoba for several years decades <laughs> since I'm a, a proud mature student and um, I wouldn't be able to receive any honors if I wasn't surrounded by fantastic people including my advisors um, John Sinclair and Rick Badak as well as all the fine people at the uh, sustainability office all my former instructors and the students that um, reach out to me and, uh, you know, I'm a proud um, student of Riddell faculty. They reach out to me and, and make sure that um, the University of Manitoba continues to strive beyond sustainability. So um, I, I really appreciate the honor and thank you to the people that nominated me. I, thanks very much. Thanks, Bill, and thanks for being here today. We appreciate it. Uh, next up is our Student Group Sustainability Award. Uh, this award recognizes a group of students who have led an initiative or project to advance one or more of the sustainable development goals. This group has all has also made and will continue making a lasting lasting positive impact on the environmental, economic, and social well-being of students at the University of Manitoba. This group must be a current student or must be a current UMSU student organization, association, or club. Um, and in good standing. An individual is not eligible to receive this award and sustainability does not have to be the mandate or mission statement of the selected student group. So I would now like to announce that the winner is the Nursing Students Association. Uh, the Nursing Students Association worked on a project titled Connecting Once, Con Connecting Once Conversation at a Time is firmly aligned with advancing the mental health and well-being focus within SGG3. The initiative, the initiative uses a multi-pronged approach to support student and mental health by situating two designated benches on the U of M campus that create safe places for peer-to-peer -peer support, speak to friends and colleagues and meet new people and or search for information about mental health and wellness through strategically placed QR codes and website links. Congratulations to the Nursing Students Association. Uh, would someone from the group like to say a few words? Hopefully somebody's here. 
If not, so you should be able to unmute yourself if you are here. I'll give them a couple more seconds. Well, join me in congratulating the Nursing Students Association. Um, I'm sure they would be excited if we could say something. Oh, Christine. Um, yeah. I think I think that Gillian now Jillian now has abil the ability to unmute themselves. Then go for it. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, good to go. Um, I just uh, so I'm the senior stick of the Nursing Students Association, um, and just on behalf of the Students Association and all the students um, involved in this project, I just want to say it's it's a huge honor to even just be nominated for this award. Um, I want to say a big thank you um, to Dr. Nitha Dick, Dr. Susan McClement, and the entire college for putting forward a nomination for us, um, as well as a thank you um, to faculty members that have worked on this project with us, so Elaine Mordock, uh, Pat Pruden, um, and Shelly Marchenko. Um, yeah, it's a huge honor, um, and we're really looking forward to um, continuing working on this project and seeing um, the positive drive forward with the uh, promotion of mental health at the University of Manitoba. Great, thank you very much for being here. We're really excited to see where this project um, goes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up is the Faculty Sustainability Award. This award recognizes an individual who has demonstrated exceptional and continuous integration of one or more of the sustainable development goals into their teaching, research, and engagement activities. This individual creates engaging opportunities for students through experiential learning, course design, innovative research, and assignment creation. This person also shows a keen interest in campus-related activities and sustainability as a whole. The nominee must be an active University of Manitoba faculty member, instructor, or postdoctoral fellow. I'd like to congratulate the award winner, um, Mr. David Van Vliet. During David's 24 years of research and teaching in the Department of City Planning, uh, David has focused on issues of sustainability, most closely addressing the UN Sustainable Development Goals concerning sustainable cities and communities, clean water, and affordable energy and climate action. He has developed an in-depth and nuanced understanding of innovative approaches to sustaining urban environments. In his teaching, David has shared his wide ranging knowledge about sustainability initiatives and technologies and courses about sustainable community design and urban, e urban ecology. He has supervised more than 60 master's thesis and capstone projects, um, plus served on a committee for dozens more in planning and the faculty of environment, earth and resources. Most of his students are now practicing as professional planners or working in environmental organizations. Congratulations, David. Would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you very much. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, surprised. Uh, that's great. <clears throat> uh, I particularly, you outlined uh, my uh, academic uh, teaching experience and uh, the types of uh, subject areas I've uh, worked on for the last over 20 years now here. Um, <clears throat> I uh, want to... Uh, um, express my uh, continuing support for the Office of Sustainability and my uh, long experience working with the uh, Sustainability Com Committee uh, and trying to move advance uh, various initiatives and projects on campus, uh, sometimes frustrating and sometimes very rewarding uh, and uh, certainly engaging to be working with other staff and uh, faculty and the students uh, in the process. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. We appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, our second last award of the day uh, is our Staff Sustainability Award. This award recognizes an individual staff member's efforts to educate, advocate, and advance one or more of the sustainable development goals within their department and or unit. This person shows a keen interest in campus-related activities and sustainability as a whole. Sustainability may or may not be defined in this person's job responsibilities, and the nominee must be an employee of the University of Manitoba. I would like to congratulate the winner, uh, Mr. Joe Ackerman, who we heard from earlier today. Uh, in 
Joe's job as manager of the Sustainability in Action facility, he shares best practices of sustainable building and educates undergraduate and graduate students through tourism mentorship. He started a program to divert the university furniture and construction waste from going to landfill, which we heard about earlier today. And Joe is a living example of commitment with sustainable principles. He teaches his students and peers with the example with example of his action and goes above and beyond to create engaging videos that can help relate, that we can all relate to. Um, it is through his work at CF that we are continually excelling in the sustainability field. So thank you, Joe. Uh, would you like to say a few words? No, let's 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 keep changing the world, Christy. You know, like we've we've really benefited from your office, so it's been uh, a good partnership we put together, and uh, let's 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 keep rolling it out. Sounds good. Thank you for all that you do, Joe. We appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for thanks for this. Uh, and our last award of the day was a game time addition to the sustainability awards. Um, so this group actually opened up our eyes to a category of award which we were neglecting. So the, Ca the Collaborative Sustainability Award recognizes a unique collaborative effort between uh, that of students, faculty, staff, and community members to integrate one or more of the sustainable development goals in a project or initiative. This unique category puts emphasis on interdepartmental interactions at the University of Manitoba in efforts to find solutions to sustainability related issues and further advance the SDGs. Um, so the winner of this first ever award is the Science Students Association in partnership with Christina Kozanski from the Faculty of Science, Anna Thermeyer and Dean Marstrav from the Faculty of Architecture, Trevor Schultz from Faculty of Science, Vanessa Duke Strutt from Architectural Engineering Services, and Lyle Warren from Operations and Maintenance. The Sustainable Students Association Courtyard Project is an ongoing lifelong learning and living project that revitalized the outdoor courtyard to the rear of the Science Student Lounge in a unique collaborative effort between students, faculty, science and architecture and central admin staff. This new university green space for students was designed as a locus where students can relax and enjoy being disconnected from technology in contact with the beauty of the natural world. This focal point for student welfare was developed as an ecologically sustainable garden space that will serve a research function as it evolves. This collaborative collaboration will continue to bear fruit for the university community. This innovative space uh, engendered goodwill and forward thinking from students faculty, administrators, staff, construction contractors, and the student landscaping firms. So I'd like to congratulate the students or the Science Students Association uh, on being the lead of this project. And I think there should be somebody here to accept the word on behalf of them. Hopefully. anybody here I can't really see my screen so I'm sorry if I you're not popping up on my end Christy yeah so if no nobody wants to speak it shouldn't be me to speak up so Dietmar uh, it would be great to have the students you know to initiate something like this uh, and to make sure that there's a budget not just for the labs for outdoor space but I would recommend all of you you are very welcome to come to that space in spring to welcome the irises, which will bloom hopefully in May. In the moment, the entire space is covered with snow, snow drifts, but it's beautiful. That's another other aspect as well. So to have the wind and the snow as co-designers. So again, welcome. Uh, try to, uh, you know, to, to, to go for a visit take care and enjoy for the space. But again, it was such a great initiative. So by the Faculty of Science started with the students, it's really unique. And we try to do our best to maintain that space in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dietmar. I believe 
Chloe is here from the Science Student Association. So Chloe, if you want to say a few words, you can unmute yourself or at the very least just say a hello. Thank you very much. Um, this project has been ongoing through four administrations of our association, so we're really excited uh, to have it open up for students when they return to campus. It's a wonderful space and uh, it was a fantastic initiative that we've all been really excited to be a part of, so we're honored to be recognized in this way and we really hope that students enjoy the space when they return to campus. Great, thank you very much. I'm so happy you could be here. Uh, we're all really looking forward to seeing this space uh, when it's not underneath snow and um, it'll be a great new addition to campus. Um, so thank you for all the work that you guys have done on this. Um, so with that, I would just like to say congratulations to all the winners and nominees in these categories. The work and effort that you put in on campus does not go unnoticed. Sustainability is a very collaborative effort and we appreciate all that you do. Um, so this wraps up Sustainability Day and the awards. And I would once again like to thank our presenters, our esteemed guests, and all of you for attending to make this a great day. Stay well. Thanks again. Mercy and Butch.